my friend is on page eight. It just says that um, the council is to establish a governance representative group to formally champion the Tairafiti Economic Action Plan, and it's on hold. But I was also curious as to why we would need to establish a further governance representative group when in actual fact the whole thing was a governance entity that developed the action plan and the participants um, were quite active in ensuring that they got to the paperwork stage that they were at. So apart from GDC wanting to drive the issues that are important for Gisborne District, why would it go through the policy of setting up another governance group? It should be reporting back to this council and we should be asking what's happening of the participants, I would think. Yeah, so um, from my perspective, and hence the council asked for it, is that there needs to be a small group of champions, okay? And that's, and I have suggested the chair of the Ngati Poro, myself, um, chair of Turonga Nui Akiwa, and a person from the business sector, and to drive the program, because otherwise it needs to be kept in the loop. And the government has suggested that they need to actually have a go-to driver group. And um, hence that is the primary reason. Supplementary, Your Worship, then, and it is important. So why is it on hold? Because under the status column, it Speaking says it's on that. hold. And I mean, that's what you've just described seems fairly straightforward. Mm. Your Worship, um, so that, that probably that action item didn't capture what the actual discussion was, which was council requesting that there is a council elected member representative on a governance type structure, because at the moment the group comprises chief executives from various parts. So that was a request, that request has been put to um, the other members of that um, group to look at what a governance entity might look like. So it's not on hold, it's actually sitting with that other governance group, which actually hasn't met yet. Or well, supplementary to that, is it likely to be the group that the mayor's just described, which sounds reasonable? Uh, I would have to have a conversation with the other members in that group because it's not just the council that are part of the um, overall, well, the steering group. Um, so other members might want their representatives on there as well. So it's likely to be those representatives, but there may be additions. And again, last question, in relation to that, because it is really important and really important for our district, when can we expect uh, an update or something to happen? Because the status is just, I mean, since the booklets were launched, not much has changed. So I believe the steering group's meeting in a couple of weeks' time. So following that, we usually have an action update at that, and then that gets forwarded on to the governance entities. Mm. There, there was a comprehensive... Um, um, update from the Dean last time. Yeah, driving this. And that's why we said, look, we need to drive it hard, hard and fast. And the frankness of it is that the government has a pot of money. They actually want to do something in our district. And we have to drive it from our end to be prepared to be spade ready. My Three years is not a long time in government. And, you know, time goes on and a lot of talky talky. But hey, we need really good action. Quite right. Right. Any other matters from the action sheet? Yeah, 005, Your Worship. We discussed yesterday upping the rate to the forestry industry. Well, that's only chicken feed compared to what we need for our roads. Where are the council or the staff in terms of the funding options? I believe we were pursuing $2 a ton across the wharf and looking at how we could capture the other ones that don't go across the wharf because that will bring some real money. Sorry about that, David. Through your worship, we've discussed whether or not we're gonna carry on with the levy at the regional transport committee meeting. Mm -hmm. Part of the discussion at regional transport was around whether or not we continued with the levy while we were still looking at the return from NZTA around the funding assistance rate for forestry roads and then looking at where the shortfall was going to be once we'd heard from NZTA whether or not we're going to be successful with getting an increased fire rate. And that was based on the rationale of the road user charges that the forestry companies are paying and to NZTA and getting an increased return from that back to the region. 
The key message is to actually have the facts to leverage as much from the government as possible at last resort will be the other ideas, the other options that are presented, because that is key. You know, we don't really want to punish our businesses, but we need to say if each truck is bring, bringing in 100,000 in ruck, and, if, and there's more than 200 trucks, I reckon there must be nearly 1,000 trucks in our district. You just multiply that to the amount of money that's coming back. There's a poultice. Quite out the message. It won't change. Thank you, Bill. It won't change. You and I know that. Any other matters from the action sheet? All good? Yes? Well, it was mentioned yesterday, just about um, it's um, 006 Lake Hales Tarafiti Observatory concept and um, progressing, and it was going to be brought to. Through your worship, yes, we are trying to push it along as fast as we can. We do have the substantive issue of actually having no funding to proceed once the designs are in place, but we are trying as much as we can to get everything ready so that we can actually apply for funding. Okay, um, any other things? We'll go on to report pages 9 to 96. Um, prior to that, I'll just welcome Tony. Toby. I should know Toby um, because my grandson's called Toby. So, welcome. Toby's going to um, present to us something. Yeah, Olympic pool, I hope. <laughs> you got pictures? We've got a slide presentation to go through. Right. So, what about that side? Or that side? Toby, floor's yours. Yeah, look, thanks, Your Worship. Um, so, just to guide you to the presentation that's been uh, forwarded for, yes. for your attention. Just give us a minute to tell you who you are. Yep. My name's Toby Mason. I'm a director of CREATE. We're a multidisciplinary design practice based uh, in Hawke's Bay and in Christchurch. We've uh, been involved in a number of aquatic centres right across New Zealand and uh, a little bit in Australia now. We're really fortunate to have the opportunity to be part of this concept design process and uh, personally quite invested in it now, having just moved to Gisborne last week. Um, We've been asked to just run through the concept design, some of the process, and then some of the thinking that sat behind some of the decision making and the reason why the recommendation has been put forward. So obviously we're all about responding to a brief. Brief from council was to, a key, to address three key objectives. That was to all compliance across the whole of the facility, to modernize it, create a year round attraction that would um, uh, in, uh, enhance community participation and really establish a great community place to recreate. The third objective was to re-establish the design life of the facility to, with a view to minimizing maintenance ongoing for the next 10 years. Within the business case, that was designed an indicative cost range of 14 to 17 million. This became our brief. And so from the outset, we were involved in condition assessment of the facility in 2014. And we're aware of the scale of the uh, facility and, and some of the latent risks and shortcomings that sat behind it. And so at the outset, we highlighted that to achieve these three key objectives across the whole asset was going to cost more closer to 28 to 29 million. So obviously up front, we had some good strategic discussions around how we would best approach this. And a consensus was taken with the most effective ex expenditure lay in establishing the year-round facility, i.e. the indoor winter use element, and then look to uh, increase the year-round element in the summer. 
that was the, the, the major shortcoming at the moment that was seen to be apparent with the facility. So we were to adopt a phased approach, phase one being the indoor, phase two, two being the outdoor elements. In terms of the site then, that then delineated an east-west um, subdivision of the site. To the south, on the left-hand side, was the elements that we would create as an indoor element. That's the 50-meter pool, the administration block, and the, uh, um, the change rooms. And then to the right-hand side, to the north, were the what we call the outside summer outdoor assets that, that would be part of phase two. So through the journey and the, through consultation with the PCG and the uh, project reference group, we established three key options. And they were look to look at a range of aquatic facilities that meet met uh, community needs and desires for a range of uh, budget expenditure. So you're, I think you're familiar with all of these. We tabled three options. The low cost option, which was uh, to do away with the 50, just have a small, learn to, uh, sorry, a small 25 meter lap pool, seven lanes with an associated warm water pool, and then change rooms that go with that. That had a price of 14 million, roughly. The mid-range option, option two, was to, again, do away with the 50-meter pool, but in its footprint, have a 25-meter lap pool, and adjacent to that was a free-form leisure pool with toddler's pool, lazy river, and a spa. That had a price of 19 million. The upper range option, option three, was to retain the 50-meter pool, but enhance it in its community appeal and use. And uh, adjacent to that, we would have the uh, learn to swim pool and a spa pool, and again, all of the change rooms that were associated with that option. That had a price estimate of between 20 and 21 million. These three options were taken to public consultation, and the feedback was uh, overwhelming support for option three, retaining of the 50 meter pool. There was a large body of support still for leisureizing and that leisure component. And so a fourth option was tabled, that combined option three with the leisure water of option two. And obviously that came with a, uh, a much more significant price increase of 29 million. From the project steering group, the reference group and public consultation, option three was selected as the preferred option to take forward. So in terms of this, its integration on the site, option three, obviously the development of the 50 meter pool then really anchors the development in its location. We've looked to optimize the way that the um, change rooms and the administration block then sit around that in a very cost-effective way. We have the learn the learners pool, the warm water pool off to the southern end, direct access off poolside for the um, change rooms, and then a central exit and entry point that forms and serves um, access and frontage to uh, Centennial Marine Drive but also forms a, a good central control point, both in the winter, for the winter indoor facility, but also for when we open up in summer. Some of the concept thinking then, an opportunity that, that sit behind uh, the, any of these concepts were, obviously, it's a completely unique facility to New Zealand. It's a great coastal setting and a really strong outdoor facility, and we, we're looking to retain and support that in our thinking. The key is to get the winter element to support that. So it's addressing the winter needs, warm, dry, climate control, but also the way it can then open up and connect in summer is a unique proposition that, that we're keen to address within the, the design. It's a large asset to um, renovate, to enclose, to heat this, all comes with a significant cost. And so any development needs to be strategic and focused and cost effective and rational when in order to meet some of these budget constraints. So part of that is the facility planning, is to come up with something that's optimized, rational, and sets up really strong relationships between spaces, but does so in a really condensed format. That then underpins really effective construction techniques, and then that flows through into something that's cost effective. The performance, obviously, of the facility is key, the, the, the energy use, the life cycle costing, and then making sure that the practical elements are discharged, but also it's engaging and fun place to be in. There's an opportunity we see in this unique setting of, of Gisborne is to use ETFE as a transparent cladding system that we used at Coastlands Aquatic Centre, the image there on the top right. 
that was introduced for this, the ability to create a, a strong visible connection with outdoor. You can be swimming indoor nice and warm when it's raining and cold outside, but also it gives you this strong visible connection to the sur surrounding environment. One of the benefits of, of this and the reason why it was adopted at Coastlands was its ability with the solar gain, the sunlight comes into the space, you can use that for free energy use, and we've captured that to heat the swimming pool. That provided year on year energy savings and that's the biggest component of, of costs on running a, an aquatic facility. And so all, the, all of the concepts and thinking are around sustainable, highly efficient energy use. And the 50 meter pool concept then underpins option three. Obviously it's legacy, traditionally viewed to be very cold, inflexible water space and somewhat elitist. We wanted to rethink that and bring new thinking to the table. And so by, um, by widening the pool and deepening it and changing the configuration of the 50 meter pool slightly, we can increase its use. The main thinking or the new th idea is that we subdivide the pool with a movable, movable bulkhead or a swim wall. This allows us to have two separate water bodies. On the right hand side, we can heat the shallower end to a, a higher temperature and, and get engagement through aquatic programs, pro programmable water, leisureize it through toys. We've got ease of access with ramp entry. And then on the left-hand side, we can use, we can, we've created a deep, cooler water body that's much more suitable for high active sports such as casual lane swimming, competition swimming, club swimming. But then it's of a profile that can allow the support of water polo, canoe polo, underwater hockey and, and expose, create a framework to support all these other water sports. And these can then run coincidentally. And then at strategic points throughout the year, the, the central dividing wall is then removed and it can run in a 50 format pool to attract those larger events. That... Within the business plan, it was identified the need to support and, and build confidence in the, in the lower, uh, younger people. And so part of all of the, the options has this strong element of learn to swim. We've been involved in lots of learn to swim around New Zealand, both for councils and for um, private learn to swim operators. And so understand the thinking that goes around that. And this type of, the, the learn to swim is a really good revenue center for any new development and key to the success of uh, it operationally. We, affect that, we understand that the development obviously affects the existing hydrotherapy pool. And so conversation needs to happen between council and DHB about how that's brought into the new design. Uh, we've been involved in uh, dedicated learn to swim and because we, they're, they're, they, they're set up to suit strategic and sensitive user groups. But we're suggesting that if budget is constrained that we could go for a compromise and link the two pools together in some way as a compromise solution and have a combined hydrotherapy and LTS. Accessibility is obviously key across the site. It's a, again, the scale of the site. We're aware of some of the level, level differentials and the difficulties of people navigating the site with, with those special needs. And so the new designs provide much more direct access to the full side from the changing rooms. We've addressed the level differentials across the site and equalized that between, you know, within the indoor facility by raising the 50 meter pool depth slightly. We've obviously created strategic pathways and, and really clear pathways for accessible people throughout the site and then enhancing engagement and accessibility to water through the use of ramps, platform lifts and accessible stairs. So overall, the, the concept thinking was around trying to create a, a framework to allow council to capture the community needs, but across a wide range of, uh, of expenditure. And so the, the selected concept, what we wanted to articulate, it's not a done deal. There's, there's a lot more discussion to be had around any of these selected options once funding is, 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 is more known. In terms of, you know, kind of what it could look like, um, and again, at the upper bound of each of the cost brackets is the use of a, a higher performance transparent cladding system that gives you this strong connection to the environment and allows us to, to use free energy solar to heat the pool. Obviously comes with a sl slightly higher uh, cost, per, um, capital cost reduces OPEX. The other end of the cost bracket is a more conventional type system where we focus on uh, the performance of the spaces rather than so much of the aesthetic as it were, but this obviously delivers a really highly durable and effective 
solution. Should budget be further constrained, there are other cost options that sit below it and make it even more cost effective. And we'll discuss those. So that's phase one. And then phase two of the development then, as, need, as funding permits, would then look to address the opportunities that sit outside the facility. We're aware that the um, dive pool is a really a prized asset. And it's fortunately, uh, minimal work needs to be done to that pool. So that will be retained as it pretty much is. The 33 meter pool is uh, leaking currently. It has some challenges in the way that it operates. And so this is the biggest opportunity to reconfigure this pool into maybe a potentially a freeform leisure pool with a combined lazy river and the toddler's pool. In doing so, then that's easier to manage that water body and control it. And then in the space where the old water toddler's pool was, we proposed that you would create a zero depth water play. In doing so, this means that this type of facility has much less control requirement because it's zero depth. And so you can break down the boundary and the constraints around that and provide a much more engaging interface with the potential walkway development that's going to happen along the seafront. And we propose that a cafe would be sited nearby and create a really family oriented destination at that location, again, to break down that boundary. The hydro, uh, hydro slide, we appreciate new developments have happened there and it's been upgraded recently. But we were just saying if any part of the new development Thinking around hydro slides has really moved on in the last 10 years, and there's great opportunity that exists in the in the area of um, hydro slides to achieve a much more prior, you know, a, a bit more of an attraction. At the top right hand corner is what was put in at Levin, which is a, a bowl and a high speed slide off a 12 meter platform, very cost effective and can be added at any point. To the left hand side is the you know of what the the outdoor freeform pool might look like. The bottom, bottom right hand corner obviously retain the dive pool in its entirety. And then when it comes to the water play, kind of the sky's the limit. We've proposed something at the moderate end, which is um, a zero depth with water play and spout. But you start to move to the upper ends where the sky's the limit. And this has just been put in at um, Splash Planet in Napier. And uh, you can see that you, this is just the entry level of these types of facilities. So I'd like to hand you back to uh, your worship for um, that draws our uh, presentation to a close and welcome any questions if that. Thank you, Toby. Good presentation. Um, so an option two, I see in the, I didn't see actually the lazy river in option two, but I saw it in the aspirational, but it was actually in option two as well. It was correct. Yes, it was yeah. shown on that. Okay. Um, some thoughts. You know, when you look at, if you're going to spend a lot of money on a, um, a swimming pool, I think it, uh, it nearly lends itself to like a, like a, a health centre um, in terms of like, you know, you've, you've got other, and, and I've always looked at the commercial element as well and what can actually bring income and whether the committee has looked up the commercial elements of like having um, just buildings you know, um, floor space for um, a gym to relocate there, uh, Pilates, yoga, um, other things that people do to increase their health. And I see there's only sort of like one spa bath in there and whether that can be a commercial operation. And it's to actually bring income into the um, thing, uh, into the complex as well. Who was the chair of Andy, was it? I oh, know we didn't have a chair as such, but there was several of us on the, you know, we've had uh, three or four meetings yeah. with Toby as we've so, been through it. Um, so Toby. what you're speaking of is, is going to add incredible expense to it. The expense comes from area, comes from space allowed. That space that's allocated to the concept that's shown at the moment probably wouldn't allow for some of the things that you've suggested. Mm -hmm. Jim has always been in front of mind when we've been looking at this concept, but it's recognised that while it uh, is considered that it would bring revenue, the actually the opposite is, is reality because of the competitiveness of the gym market and ha having to administer that gym. I mean, uh, most gyms do struggle for make. Put, put it no, I'm wood. just saying there will be private operators yep. leasing the space. 
You don't have to operate the gym. You don't have to operate. Yeah, even on that level, it would be hard to make it very profitable to the Olympic pool complex because of the space requirements and administration of that. How um, do you know? Uh, because Toby's had a good look at that. Because you know gym jets, space. jets mm. they release a commercial space. It was suggested in, in the early stages know? of gym. We've always discussed gym, but it's something that we haven't seen clarity that it would be profitable to the Olympic pool because of the space requirement of having a sufficient gym space there. So uh, sure, if, if, if there was a business case that said that the gym was gonna bring X dollars and it was gonna be profitable dollars, we would look at it, but we couldn't see that as we were going through the process. No, but all I'm saying is you provide the building, yeah. you sell the goodwill to that building and they pay a rental. That's it, finish. Yeah, I hear That's, what you're saying. That comes in. Mm. We're not asking for operator, mm. telephone operator. Yeah. Your anyway. Worship, if I could just interject, um, we were briefed by um, Mark and uh, Robson from the local council, and they'd probably be able to talk to some of those briefing objectives. Yeah, um, the use of a gym was looked at in the initial business case. It was done last year, and it, um, it ruled it out. It's been um, not a core thing, or and for, and like I said, it's cost and um, the economics of it. So it has been looked at during the business case stage of the project. Mm. Um, I'm not convinced. Can I comment, Your Worship? Going back some years ago, we had this big one, including that sort of uh, topic you're talking about, and um, we were looking at even shutting the street off between the to build it in there and, and, and to fit to actually make the room for it. And that must have been what 12 years ago. And everybody traipsed off to Tarong and had a look at a big complex over there, and the, and they've been right through that. And I think the, the actual cost, despite what the income was, just was just so it just blew right over the top. And and and, I, and on my my thoughts are, we're actually better off settling for something that's realistic and getting it done, mm -hmm. rather than building big dreams. And and in another twelve years, we're sitting here trying to actually come up with a plan for the pool, you know. And 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 that's been half the problem and at this, at this stage, if this is realistic and if everybody around here thinks this is realistic. Brian. Yes, Your Worship. Look, I was a chairman of that uh, uh, initial committee that looked at um, uh, the combination of an aquatic centre with a multi-purpose stadium and with uh, all the other uh, facilities you were talking about. And uh, uh, Councillor Thompson's quite right. The thing in the end just got bogged down with detail uh, and then when it comes to gyms, you've got to realise that there are a lot of gyms in Gisborne and the, the history in Gisborne has not been good. Many gyms have opened and they've closed. There's been a huge history of that for all the time that I've lived in Gisborne. And some of the, like the one you mentioned before, you know, it, it has a lot of competition and, and they are struggling. Some of the gyms are struggling. How do you know? I know that because I'm, in, uh, I'm the chairman of the YMCA, which competes in that business. So I'm well aware of what the market is like. Yeah, but how do you know that the one that I mentioned is struggling? Because well, obviously we are in the business and we make it our business to find out about how our competitors are going. Show me the numbers. Exactly. You don't know. All anyway, I'm say, anyway, all I'm saying is that we're better to concentrate on aquatic centre. You know, uh, uh, concentrate as Thompson councillors. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Thompson says that, that we will never get the point thing order, going. Please, point, point of order. Um, we're talking about commercial sensitivity aspects there that shouldn't be mentioned in public. I, I think we've got... Yeah, yeah. Point of order, yeah, we, we shouldn't be discussing another business when we've got nothing. No, you're no, quite right. Place. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so all I'm saying is that uh, uh, we, we've been looking at this uh, issue for, uh, as Councillor Thompson says, 12 years. And here's our opportunity. We've got a, a good plan in place. It seems reasonable. Uh, it is fairly expensive, but a council commitment is uh, um, uh, restricted to uh, the 5.65 million. If we can't raise the, the extra money, well, obviously we'll have to scale it back. But uh, we have committed to our um, portion of it. And, uh, and I think this is our opportunity to actually put it in the plan and get on with it. Mm. So, yes, uh, Councillor Stoltz. 
This is my first time online. <laughs> I feel like standing, but I shouldn't. No, I'm just supporting what Graham and Brian are saying. This is a plan. We've gone out to our community. The pool is used every day by hundreds, thousands of our young kids and families. This looks like a sensible plan in phases. So I am ready to support this. Councillor Fien. I'll move. I'll second. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Toby, um, for the great presentation. I just have a question um, for myself, really, in terms of energy savings. Can you give a, the solar feature? Can I have some idea of what sort of costs we're looking at, so what sort of savings? So, yeah, thanks. Um, in terms of coastlands, I can talk directly from that. It's a 3,200 square metre facility. Thank you, Your Worship. Point of order. Can we just have one conversation? Because it is really hard. Your phone's over there, but still on it. Shh, Andy's was. Anyway, Toby. Okay, look, I can talk from a particular case point um, at Coastlands Aquatic Centre, which is a 3,200 square metre facility, so close to the size of option three, slightly smaller, but that provided a, a 30,000 year, a 30,000 K saving year on year. That was just for the energy use and was tested within the environment for using the ETFE as a solar collector. Mm. Councillor Akohata Brown. Thank you, Worship. Um, to you, Toby, um, and everyone else. Uh, just in regards to this project, my interest is uh, around the cultural kind of framework of our point of difference as a region, and we've just been on this, uh, well, we're on this navigation journey. So I just wondered if the facility itself and its creation would have, could have that component. I mean, in a sense, I know that you've designed something that's fit for purpose, which is what we've needed, um, but adding the, you know, the concepts of navigations and other, I see the pirate ship, but <laughs> we've got this new hotel, um, uh, you know, walker voyaging um, space. So I just wondered if those components or concepts were discussed. Um, only at a really high level. At the moment, we've, we've really been at this high level thinking to try and understand the shape of what it is and to create some funding around that shape how it is and we would really welcome cultural buy-in, community buy-in and should shape how it looks within any development in the, in the latter phases that can honestly can be engaged and brought together. So any community in, engagement would be, you know, it's, it's essential, isn't it, to the, to the success of this unique facility. Yeah. Thank you. So, Councillor Dowsing. Um, again, my question's for Toby and it's a little bit more, um, around the OPEX and um, as Councillor Finn uh, touched upon, energy savings may be made. Um, obviously there's a, there's a couple of different concepts for design of the rooftop, um, one with a one with a glass dome, one with a, one with a solid traditional sp um, style roof. I understand that heating and cooling are likely the, the largest OPEX costs of a facility like that, like this, is that correct? It can be, yeah. Um, some are, Summer essentially a lot of cooling to be done in Gisborne, I'm, Absolutely, yeah. I assume, yeah. and then um, and then the, the water temperature keeps the facility at temperature during winter. Uh, uh, again, I assume that there's always a heating demand during winter. Yeah. In fact, quite a lot, a lot of the year round in terms of the water. Yeah. Yeah. So um, obviously, all of our figures in this are based on um, projections. So we're we're projecting a swims per head for the community, and, and that that uh, dictates our our a number of uh, number of users that then tells us from that number of users how what our estimated opex costs are based on a uh, on a calculation of um, uh, cost recovery and then we and then we go from there from opex we project our um, our cost per admission um, and then we get back to the tricky situation where as we develop a larger facility our cost per admission goes up and that may well affect our our, our um, user base uh, in a low socio town. So um, I, I, I have a little concern about the sustainability at the OPEX levels we've projected um, if we're not achieving our um, at the higher level of our uh, uh, user group. Now, what I'm really getting to as a question is have we looked into um, 
more sustainable uh, source of forms of energy or where there's, where there's practical savings around energy use in the design. So just to talk firstly to your point then, um, we had a partner brought in as part of the design called Global Leisure Group and they, they were, their part is uh, around looking at benchmarking facilities and creating sizes of facilities that respond to community needs. They used and they use um, Sport NZ guidance for that. It's also it's the OPEX figures that they've come back with are not based on actual figures, they're based on benchmarking figures from Yardstick in, in order that we can create an equalized high level assessment, a comparative level between each of the options, if that makes sense. So we, obviously with the current facility, we have actual numbers and we've used those to com compare. So when they've used Yardstick's figures, they've been very conservative, both in terms of the visitor numbers that we've assumed and taken into account you know, all of the other assets that you have, like the great beaches here. So they've pegged at a very low level. And in terms of the OPEX, then we've taken a conservative approach. So we've been, what we feel is quite conservative in those numbers. But as part of any concept design going forward, that thinking can be interrogated further in the, as the design develops into all of the new renewable energy sources that can be. So these are based on, uh, as I understand it, uh, facilities that exist and facilities typically meet eco benchmark in terms of energy use. We try to get way below eco benchmarks in the types of facilities that we drive, you know, we design, and to further provide those savings, both on energy use, water saving across the board. So to answer your question is, you, you should have some reassurance around the numbers being conservative in that they're comparative. There has been some thought and due diligence around, you know, some care taken that, you know, we don't provide a facility that's irrelevant to the community needs. And so, um, I don't know whether Mark and Robson, you know, from yeah, the council would like to talk so to. I really do like the design. It's not a design question. Um, but yeah, it's around, it's around whether um, spending perhaps a million or two million more on one of those designs in energy efficient solutions will actually reduce our OPEX long term and, and give us a better co uh, life cost. Um, so, yeah, because I mean, we're, because we're looking at an increase of 1.2 to 1.5 million per year. Optics. So just to hand over, before I hand over to Robson, just to support that conversation, when you look at the, the use profile of the facility, it's all buoyed up by summer. During winter for eight months, it's very low occupancy, you know, quite considerably low. And so the numbers we've taken to grow that element, and, you know, we're not increasing the asset size, we're actually consolidating it and make it run more effectively. And then, you know, by its nature, it's going to draw a lot more people through that, that part of the year that's very currently very low in its occupancy and revenue. Councillor Seymour. Councillor Seymour. Thank you. On page 62, I appreciate that it was a great presentation, but you've talked about the estimated revenue for identified options. And you've used oh, this the document, and fair enough, has used Sport Gisborne and uh, Sport New Zealand uh, calculations. Has anybody, you know, has anybody double checked those? Because they vary from, you know, a thousand dollars per square meter to fifteen hundred dollars per square meter. So are we able to Check that against um, another community that might be like our own. So, you know, at 7.1, the report. If, if, yeah. 62, oh, sorry, was it not on? At page 62 and 7.1, it says it's Sport New Zealand figures of income averages to be. Yeah. And so I just wonder have we actually looked at a sporting facility if we're using this kind of data and saying that this is what we can afford which is extrapolated out into some of the tables beyond that have we i mean I, we don't have to have it publicized here but could the committee look at you know is there some relativity between that projected income and another community of an income like our own yeah so all of these come from yardstick which look at a national database of facilities so all these figures as i understand and global leisure would be much better to talk to this but are derived by a lot of interrogation and thinking. And so they've created a, a boundary, yeah, based off real numbers and real facilities that are applicable to Gisborne. Mm. But the point I'm making, it's not clear whether this is based on lower levels of income per square meter. And so we're saying that the business, the entity once it's set up is going to generate $1,000 per square meter or 1,500. And that's quite a big, big difference. And it would be just quite helpful to know you know, so, so those income profiles tools uh, in a similar situation in a similar um, township to our own city to our own what kind of income they generate so we've got a bit of an idea 
so through the chair, um, as part of the benchmarking, they did they looked at um, Marlborough, um, some of the Bay of Plenty and Hawke's Bay, and some of the Northland ones as well, which included as a side of the benchmark, just as a sanity check. So, but, okay. but we could look into that further as well. But we did look at specific Thank communities you. similar to ours. Thank you. That's what I want. Councillor Thompson. I can't hear what they're saying. Um, Good excuse. Um, the president, what is the president admission to the pool? And on page 37, is, it, is this what you're proposing that it goes up to option three? It says cost per mission $10.26, is that correct? No, so that's, sorry. So that's a total cost per admission? So that um, so at the gate you take a portion of it and then um, and then the remainder is made up from the council subsidy. So if the emission numbers. Oh, so if the total opex is divided by. It's how much cost to operate? Yes, yes. The emissions. Correct. That equals okay. that figure per admission. And so, what is the estimate of the new admission at the gate? We haven't. We benchmarked it off staying the same. Staying the same. So so that one point. Oh, whatever it is, it's small writing. Um, that's in million. That's that's the estimated um, opex, assuming the price admission is the same as what's present. Okay, happy. Karen, Miss Councillor Finn. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just um, supplementary to um, Councillor Thompson's question, in terms of admissions. My understanding is admissions to the pool have been declining over the years. What, what um, sort of guarantee do we have that this type of pool is actually going to um, increase admissions? Because obviously we need increased admissions. Or so, stop the decline. Is it because the pool is not up to standard at the moment? Is that the main reason? I think if we, I could hand you to Robson, who can relay some of the feedback of users that have been using the facility and the reasons why they don't, firstly. Um, secondly, then, the, the, in the forecast numbers are based on all the communities around New Zealand and really looked at places that are, uh, are similar to Gisborne, you know, like Nelson, of a similar kind of uh, demographic and I mean, in terms of its climate demographic, you know, and access to great rivers, great lakes, and then support it. So we've taken a very conservative approach to those forecast swims per head because of these other things that sit around um, the other opportunities here in terms of water spaces, such as beaches, they tend to peg that back a little bit. But if I can talk to you, hand you to Robson, who can talk to. Just to follow up on that, um, as I'm sure we would agree, over the summer months, it is very busy down there. Um, it's the winter months that we would obviously be trying to lift the admission um, amount um, for those, those colder months. A lot of the feedback we get is that it is just too cold to go down um, and particularly get changes of changing rooms and come through mm. the, the main 50 metre facility. Um, it's also, these, um, this concept option opens the door to a lot of opportunity around the, um, the sports that, that, that Toby spoke about earlier. Um, and also creating that nice warm environment and a lot more of a destination. So folk can come here in the middle of winter and through the middle of summer and say, let's go down the pool, take our family. And, um, and these, these admission numbers have been um, yeah, benchmarked across um, all the national averages for that type of facility. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank Councilor you. Wilson. Thank you, Worship. Uh, just a, a, another factor that um, uh, was always considered as uh, desirable for this aquatic centre is that Gisborne being in a unique situation where it's actually a long way to go before you come to another centre with uh, similar facilities. And that we are fairly unique in that respect. There's not many um, towns and cities around the place that aren't close to somewhere else. So we've got a sort of a captive audit, audience here. And uh, uh, as we know, uh, Gisborne people uh, like doing things. And I, I believe that this thing will be actually used more to hit a population and it will in other centres, just for that very reason, because we have got the captive audience. Councillor Finn. I was just going to say, I'll second um, recommendations. Yeah, it's been Thank moved you. by Councillor Cranston, seconded by Councillor Finn, Councillor Seymour. Yes, Your Worship, I was just going to say, um, similar to Councillor Stoltz earlier, 
it really is time to get on with the project. A lot of work has gone into it. We've talked about it for ages and ages. There's some good questions that people can ask. I, for one, would, because it's intimated that there wasn't a lot of work to do with the deep dive pool, that it, maybe we need to look at whether the deep dive pool is fixed in, in the first stage. You know, those are things that can continue to be looked at if there wasn't a lot of additional cost there, but I just think we should put the resolution, it's been moved and seconded, and get on with it. It's, um, dive pool has got a number called zero. Might need a paint job. That's Councillor what Cranston. Said, but it's outside. Um, Councillor Cranston. Yeah, thank you. The reason I was happy to move this is, I mean, it has been around for a couple of decades. Uh, Councillor Seam was quite right, and it has been front of mind right through that time. But um, there's been specific consultation on this um, development, and it's pretty much always, I mean, never going to be always, been positively supported by the community, and a lot of the community has said to get on with it. The most recent positive consultation was what was happening through the facility strategy, where that consultation had um, the Olympic pool uh, discuss that length as well. And the con that also brought positivity on, hey, you guys need to get on with it. So that's why I'm more than happy to move this, because it, like I say, it's been around a couple of decades, and it's always been supported and given direction to get on with it for a couple of decades. So we can't wait another decade. Sure, the numbers are big and they're scary, We've got to figure out how to do it, but we've got to uh, put, put it into the long-term plan so that we can do that. Originally, we were going to start building this pool in 2014. Councillor Foster. Yeah, I'm, I'm really supportive of this project. Like um, Andy said and everyone else has said, you know, it's been around for so long now. The community has been right behind it. We've heard um, so much positive feedback so far from all um, all the work we've been doing to promote it. Um, the other side of it is that, you know, it is a unique area. That area is just so unique. You don't get many other pool complexes right on the beach. We've got a huge area there as well. So I believe other, um, other activities could certainly thrive off this activity once it's done. Um, the other side too is that um, our seen the um, uh, Wike and I motor camp just put in a pool. They, they realize that over winter time, if they're going to attract customers, they need to have a pool, a warm pool to um, attract the customers over winter, which has been proven right around the country in motor camps. So having a facility here like we're promoting um, over winter time will be a great tourism asset as well for our winter. Mm. Great, Councillor Dunn. Um, yes, I've been on the working party for this project, so I'm fully in support of it. Um, one of the things we haven't touched on yet, but what I think is exciting is when we get the uh, cultural layer put over this building, like we've done with Onido Cycleway, like we've done with um, Awadua, it really is going to be quite magnificent as well. Thank you. So let's do it. Let's do it. So, okay. So the river um, costs, is it? about six or seven million is that right the river so the outdoor uh, the laser lazy river is it six or seven million bucks no so it's not in the concept okay that's the outdoor pools stage two see reading your agenda it's in it's in stage two it is which yeah. is within the cost breadth yes an inter interesting thing you know, like the War Memorial Theatre, the do-up has attracted more shows, more patronage, and I am sure that the Olympic pool will attract more people to the Olympic pools. Now, even for five or six or seven dollars, if you stay there all day, it's only a dollar an hour. It's such cheap entertainment. Hopefully it doesn't become, you know, people just leave their kids there for babysitting. Must supervise them. Anyway, thank you for the councillor's um, contribution. Thank you to our staff's contribution. Thank you to our community's contribution. The main thing now is let's do it. But I'd also bring up one thing. It takes a while to do. Can we set up a Olympic pool fundraising trust like we've done for the War Memorial Theatre and the Lawson Field Theatre. Can we do that? Yep. And can we add that to the resolution? Because it needs to, all that paperwork needs to be done. 
con um, find out who's going to chair the committee, drive the committee, committee members getting the charitable status in the first instance just takes a bit of time. Hey, I don't so like the way you're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good job for retired retirement. Okay, so I put it all in favour with with that um, charitable trust stuff, fundraising trust, right? And we'll figure out the membership and the components later, but that'll be just for Nadine to start that process. All right? Yes? Detail around the people who are on the trust or else it becomes the CCO. So you need to be quite careful about how that is set Absolutely. Up. Thank you for that advice. All in favour? I country carry. Thank you, gentlemen, ladies, and our community. Right, so we go to the next matter, which is Edgecom and its implications to Taita Fiji, the consultation, page 97 to 113, LTP formal consultation. Yes, I know. I'm doing the LTP first. I'm yeah. happy to move to page 97, which is the content of the report on long-term plan formal consultation. But I just want to make it on page 99 and so moving. I do want to make it really clear that I do believe our communities should have meetings. And I understand from yesterday that that will happen, but I don't necessarily think that they always need to be segregated. So what has been working well for our townships on the coast is community meetings in, in the early evening and not necessarily. I mean, there will always be a place for special interest group meetings, but there must be a place for our townships to have a meeting where a whole range of the community come together and that, that's been really successful. And while it might be inferred, I don't think it's really clear in 21 and 22 that that will continue. So I just want to make sure that that does happen. They value the mayor going to, the, to those meetings they value the opportunity to raise other matters that might not have been raised previously. Some of our townships have regular community meetings and some only have them when the mayor goes out or and the mayor and the councillor are there. So I just think that's so important, but I'm happy to move the contents of the report. Yep. And you never know what happens at these meetings because last year, man, did we hit a bombshell in terms of roads. Mm. We never knew that till they told us at the coalface. Right, and we really appreciate that. Now, did you want to say anything? Yes, okay, Councillor thing, Dowsing. Thing is, Bishop, I, I uh, mentioned this yesterday also, but on page 110, the first uh, item for key decision um, for LTP consultation is how much to invest on what and over what time frame to reduce the risk of dry weather overflows. Uh, now that dry weather overflows are a non-permitted event, um, I believe that's not, I, I don't believe that should be for LTP consultation. I think that um, that's a matter for staff to manage um, and ensure that the correct amount of investment is in place to make sure that that doesn't happen. The other thing too um, is that, you know, there are so many meetings and so many short opportunities to actually um, talk to our community about it. And it's to really get all of those topics. Like Easter trading's taken two years, right? It's really not on, really. Um, other matters that need consultation, let's do it and put it all in one bundle and get our community's feedback and start that process. Councillor Stoltz. I would like to make a comment about the uh, one of these meetings, and I support what Councillor Seymour said. We still do our formal over March, April, when the, the mayor goes out. But what I think the community loved about these community meetings at, is that the community meetings came to them. They, um, Eddie and them went with a bus to the beach. We had um, Grey Power. I had about 200, 300 people there that day, and we probably engaged for an hour and a half, and our staff showed them how to make these submissions. So this was a totally different social interaction with our community which I think they really loved. And this is to complement the more formal um, consultation we'll do in March and April. So I really want to compliment the staff for going outside the square, doing things a little bit different. And um, it was a great, great success. I think we should buy that combi van and not lease it. I didn't know how to put it into reverse. I couldn't get it at my drive, Eddie. Anyway, um, Jay and... Um, 
Mrs. How Miss Howhausen has got a uh, presentation. We'll we'll do that first, eh? They put a lot of work into this. Two slides. No point of water. Yeah. Is this is this the same um, presentation we've had several times? Because we've got a pile of material today. Everybody supports. No, what's no, going to be done? Are we? Is it, let, is it adding to our discussion? It adds value. I've seen, I've seen it. Kia ora koutou. Right. Testing. Okay. Um, thank you. And I've noted um, comments um, and we'll be a little bit more time for questions at the end of the presentation. So hopefully the presentation will answer some of those um, questions that you've just raised as well. Uh, so through so September, October, we had the seven week early engagement campaign, um, What's the Future, which we felt was really successful, um, increased our face-to-face -face engagement with the community. And um, as you've said, Council of the Stolts, um, uh, very, the social interaction and the, the feel good factor, um, I think really reached out to the community. Um, we continued some conversations throughout November and December. Uh, so surveys on the wastewater treatment, the Olympic pool um, went out um, and the high level results were presented to you at the prioritisation workshops on the, um, the key issues for the community um, that came out of early engagement. Um, so really the purpose of the consultation document um, following local government changes um, back in 2014 um, essentially, the consultation document itself um, needs to present our, our overall story for our future. Um, the criteria of the consultation document is quite specific, um, where we must pull out some of those significant issues that we identify, um, our significant assets and significant projects for the future, and provide some optionality to the community about the options that we looked at and what our preferred options might be. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, more in the the next few slides. Um, but essentially what we're looking to do with the consultation document is provide councillors with some clear feedback on those significant decisions to be made. Um, so that's the main uh, driver of the consultation document, if you like. So as I said, the overall story of our consultation document is quite important in the story that we tell our community. Um, and we are looking at the messaging behind um, that. And I think Councillor um, Dunn, 5% of Thrive was something that was floated um, uh, late last year. Um, so our story will focus essentially that we're getting back to basics. We're going to be focusing our spending on the infrastructure that our community needs and it is important to them. Um, so that's where our strategic priorities come in and that's where we'll be highlighting those in the consultation document. Uh, it will also include the, the uh, key issues that we will want to provide the options for. Um, we need to identify uh, the financial impact and the level of service impact for our community. And it'll also go over all the other infrastructure and activities, quite um, significant infrastructure changes that we'll be looking at over the next 10 years. So talking about those key issues and options, um, they were identified um, as important to the community through early engagement, through your prioritisation workshops late last year, um, and through the infrastructure strategy, those key significant decisions that need to be made in there. Um, Councillor Dowsing, it may not include every, um, every question that there is in this, in this infrastructure strategy. It may outline our, our preferred option um, where people can refer to the infrastructure strategy for more information. And if they want to, they could submit on that, but we won't be pulling out dry weather overflows as a, um, as a specific option to, to, to weigh up, if you like. Um, so we'll be looking at um, roads, wastewater treatment, drain-wise, uh, the Olympic pool upgrade and the Taruhiru cycleway. Um, for each of those, we might provide two, the two to three options. And the options are those options that you've seen before that will have been outlined in the infrastructure strategy. Um, but as you know, we're still, um, you know, still making decisions. You've just made a decision this morning in the Olympic pool where we might need to put, we're not, we need to put together what those, um, the specific content of those options are. Yes. Jade, when we consult, obviously the first three options are core council projects, but the last two are dependent on external funding. Do we make it clear to the community when we do consult that it is not up to us, it is up to us to try and find the money, 
but those last two projects are dependent on external funding which we need to raise. Yes, definitely. So we outline all of the financial implications, so the level of investment that's needed to um, complete the project, the level, level of council's contribution, um, so what ratepayers are actually putting towards that project, and particularly also the timeframes that when, when those, which projects are done sooner rather than later. And so that's the type of feedback that you'll re we hope to receive from the community is when they want things done, how much they want to spend on it. Um, and that will hopefully give you some clear, clear guidance for decision making. Can, can, sorry, can I also ask a question about those topics? Like the drain wise one is a, a fairly complex topic really, as we know, you know, with the, uh, the issues around um, flooding on private property and everything, I, I just wonder how you, um, you're going to consult on that because it is, uh, it's complex and, and uh, controversial, if we want to call it. Um, as I said, we're working through the, what, the actual, what the specific content will be, and that we'll be working with managers night level um, to determine what that is. Um, from the infrastructure strategy document, there were some optionality given to uh, the level of investment in, in um, private property. Um, how much do we invest in, in uh, fixing the private property? And I believe you had a presentation on that yesterday um, from um, David Wilson. Um, so an, an, our preferred option will be presenting that option um, where it, it's, uh, um, how do I say? Uh, yeah, not the Presenting our preferred option and then what is, what is the alternative, if you like? In actual fact, um, Councillor Wilson, it could be when we make the decision, the private part, what is the policy of paying, mm -hmm. that will be important. Yeah, yeah, that would be it. Yeah, so be a good thing to consult on. We take your thing on board, but yeah. I think that's the component that we'll be saying, we are doing drain-wise, there is private and there is public. So how is the, next, the pub, private part going to be funded and what is the quantum throughout the, throughout the catchment? Likewise, for fear of risk of, um, of repeating ourselves, I think that uh, the wastewater um, consultation should probably have the unsupported options removed because currently it's discussing five options still. And we know that several of those are actually essentially redundant options. Yeah. Um, so. For example, the, the default option is one that is unsupported by Council Iwi, uh, so that, probably, that, that can probably be removed from consultation to clarify our points. I mean, it's, it's really informing the commu community of the Council decision, because we've actually made the decision, haven't we? Preferred, Preferred decision. Preferred and the same as the Olympic pool, you know? We've already today, just two Preferred. minutes ago. Preferred. Yeah. Okay. Preferred. Yep, um, Not the option. Yep, three, three no, worships. So yeah, just resolution. to, to that clarify that, um, the consultation document that we're talking about has legislative requirements as to what we need to include in that. And yeah, the preferred option is what we will. So we could talk about options, but actually you've decided this morning on a preferred option for the Olympic pool redevelopment. So we'll be putting that forward as the council's preferred option and everything gets modelled on that. There'd have to be some substantive community kickback through a consultation process that would make you revisit that. But essentially we're not going out there and going and reconsulting on options, concept one, two or three, we're putting forward the preferred option. We will talk about the other ones that were considered, but this is where we've landed for the proposed draft long-term plan. But isn't, you know, like I read the resolution on page 10, we have adopted, it's not a preferred, this is what we're gonna do. You know what I mean? Yeah, but Your Worship, when you go out to consultation, you can't have a, a, a preconceived idea before you do the consultation. But you can put your preferred option out there and do all your modelling on it. And, and no, through Your Worship... You're, 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 you're adopted. If you have preferred, you've got to give a couple of options. Your Worship, you have adopted concept option three for inclusion in the draft LTP. Yeah. And when we say inclusion in the draft LTP, the draft LTP is subject to the special consultative procedure, which means it goes out for consultation. We've, all, okay. we've okay. always done okay. it like this. I'm always wrong, that's right. <laughs> Next one. Um, uh, thank you, Jane. Essentially, we're looking Fantastic. to, the feedback that we're looking to get through submissions is to confirm your preferred yep. options with the Come community. On. Okay. Let's go and focus on the recommendations. That's already been done. We don't worry about the looking for 
Is it some more? Uh, a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more. How many more pages? Uh, a few, a little bit more. I'll speed through it real quick. I know it's morning tea time. Maybe. Two minutes, Jane. Yeah, we'll talk about the little bit the the, the plan for the engagement plan. So a little bit of the look and feel, keeping it quite high level, keeping the WTF brand um, to for that familiarity um, with the community. Um, and linking it back to early engagement. So uh, our going out to deliver our consultation, um, we will be looking to meet or exceed what we've done with the early engagement. Um, and again, we've talked about targeted feedback and submissions. Um, okay, just back, yeah. back one slide. Yep. Directed, how do you identify direct financial implication people? Revenue and finance policy. So, but then they, your audience, rate payers. Uh, do you, what, we're talking about our audiences. So, what we normally do would we'd, we'd identify some target audiences um, to do some specific so communications we're do out to. Consultation mm -hmm. with them. So, rate payers will get something with their rates letters okay. and things like that. Um, We'll just speed through this quickly. So there is a, a, a high level, um, our target audiences, quite important there. We're looking at um, our, our uh, engagement with um, Māori on both the iwi level and at the um, marae hapu community level. So can we just use iwi, not Māori? Because Māori are anyone. Yes. Iwi, are iwi and Māori community. Hey. So we'll I be know the local government uses Māori, and it's the wrong word. Okay, we can, we can. Yep, next page. <laughs> so going going through those channels that we'll be using, um, so we're looking, we'll have our consultation document, and we're looking to deliver that in a few, a variety of ways, um, your traditional hard copy, online, and looking at some sort of video, um, again, uh, innovative ways to create, get that feedback as well. Um, coming through to the meetings and community meetings in Hui. So um, we had great success last time with going out to already organised community events and going out to where people were already. Um, yes, there might be communities where there's nothing happening and where we will schedule meetings with those communities. So definitely for our, our rural areas, our coastal areas, um, we, may, we will design our schedule of events and encourage councillors to come to those schedule of events, whether they are community meetings, whether they are meetings with special interest groups, whether they are events that are happening in the community. Um, we'll have a whole array, array of those um, happening throughout the, the consultation period. So um, be sure that there will be um, targeted community meetings in, in the various uh, rural areas. So our outcome is to actually achieve the same level, if not a better level of engagement that we did with the pre-engagement. Uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll also follow up with, and um, we'll be doing hearings as well. So um, that will meet also the face-to-face face, face -face, um, requirement that we are, we are legislated to do through um, consultation. Uh, essentially, there's your rough timeline. We'll be uh, providing the cons draft consultation doc document to you um, early uh, at the end of February for adoption in March. Uh, we'll be looking to start a soft launch of our consultation on, from the 5th of March, ending on the 15th of April, um, before hearings in May. Thank you very yes. much. Councillor Burdett. Yes, you got the list of venues that you intend to go to? Later. We'll be developing that um, this month. Yep. Did you read your email? Councillor Thompson. Yes. Oh. You've got white hair. You've got white hair, Councillor. You're old. What about Chinese people? Mm. Okay. I didn't realize you had white hair. All good. All good. All in favor? Aye. Contrary. Carried. Edgecombe. Next, next slot. Um, move.
Okay, moved by Councillor Dowsing, second by Councillor Finn. Any questions, any presentations? Kaori. And we are doing the Wai Power Flood Control Scheme. We are aware yes. we didn't have stones in our thing when we built it. It was all properly constructed by Monk Brothers those days, back in 1952. And it took a few years. Congratulations. All in favor, I contrary, carry. Break. Carry. I just want to say, I've received two texts from people watching us online. And yeah. they asked why Brian and myself and what about the mayor? He wasn't on camera before. <laughs> Amber's not on camera either.
Committee, and it is Wood First Policy for the Gisborne District Council. And I think it's a, um, a great policy to show leadership. Um, we've got a number of organisations, and more particularly um, the wood industry, ECT, um, in this game here of actually facilitating for wood clusters. And, you know, it doesn't cost any money, but their leadership here is important to actually lead the way for us and encourage our community um, to use wood as much as possible. We have a large resource of timber, and it's great if we can actually use the sustainable, renewable um, resource um, in as many projects as we can. Now, I can give you an example of leadership. Now, a little while ago, when we started doing our Glaston Road, um, all the plantings in 2000, and 2000 for the millennium, um, people actually said, oh, that's a good idea. And a lot of people have actually put up palm trees and that type of um, planting in their proper, own private properties and on their businesses. Now, we actually have um, people painting walls. There's one project that started off um, in the Bright Street car park. And now there are private businesses saying, what a great idea, following in the footsteps of that leadership from uh, Kōtiro Atahua, is Project Atahua. And so um, Wood Industry, um, Wood First, would say, yeah, that's a good idea in terms of like um, supporting our wood industry. Um, you know, the Eastland Community Trust now has really focused on this wood cluster and imminently at any time there is going to be two um, wood processing, adding value to the resource that we have, and they will make, will be making building products. And if we promote our region as that wood first, not only for users, but to, to um, show leadership that people saying, wow, this place is actually focusing on wood. Maybe this is the place to actually come to, to actually set up businesses and that sort of thing. So I just ask for council support and the philosophy of um, Wood First Gisborne East Coast. Moved by Councillor Seymour, seconded by Councillor Burdett. Councillor Dowsing. Thank you, His Worship. Um, I, I was just going to point out a little bit of irony uh, in that we're in our first meeting in Awarua today and we're in a steel frame building with aluminium slats. Um, We've got a, a, a very large War Memorial Theatre, which isn't made of wood. We've got, uh, so would you expect council to become a leader of this policy? For example, when we discussed the Olympic pool re, uh, this morning, would you consider that as a wood first project and we would be doing a, a large span building with wood first? Well, yeah. And you have a look at um, Bob Jones. He's building the biggest, tallest wood building in the world. And it is stronger, stronger than steel, stronger. So I think, yeah, we should consider those options. So it's supplementary then. If council's a leader, how do we ensure best value for our community um, if, we're, if we're taking it from an approach of materials instead of cost basis? Yeah, I understand that wood is cheaper and stronger. Councillor Stoltz. Wanted, I see that you mentioned in, in number two, I request Activate Tairawhiti um, to develop the wood policy to be. Um, have you had discussions with them already to see if they might have something similar in the pipeline? Or have had developed something um, around this to sit with the TEEP? Yep. So what I have done is actually um, socialised this topic with the Eastland Wood Council. Yep. And they are very keen. Um, the New Zealand Forest Wood uh, Products um, Organisation and its other associated organisations, they're actually coming to Gisborne um, to give support to this. Um, three executives from that organisation. Um, and, and ECT, I've socialised this with ECT um, to our, our um, chief executive, Mr. Gavin Murphy, and Mr. Michael Muir, our chair. So there is um, general good support for this, 
And I think the leadership will permeate throughout our community when people are thinking about it. Because you think about steel or other products that you've got to import and the pollution that it provides. And we need to actually take note of this climate change, whether we believe it or not. It is our responsibility to actually look after this earth for future generations as much as possible, whether we're believers or not of climate change. And that's why I am actually looking at the thoughts of um, this particular philosophy and, and why we should actually have paper, plastic or wheelie bins. What is the best option going forward for our communities and the future generations into the future? Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Bruce. I have no problem with this as it's written. Your, your, the original one was to direct our staff to go and produce, and I thought, well, we've got some pretty important stuff that they need to do first, and it was just to create a problem, you know, just mm -hmm. created a, a backbone to work for them. So, but as, as it's written here, I'll, I'll support it. But, uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, in, in, in response to Shannon's, uh, Councillor Dowsing, sorry, um, Councillor Dowsing, um, comments, it, it, will be, it will be governed by by doability, you can't, you know, there, there were, there's limitations on products and, 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 and Mr. Jones would have built a big building that could be built in wood and, and with modern LBL products, um, you, your, uh, your, your scope of, of what you can do with wood is, has become far greater in the last few years. And, but at the end of the day, it, it will still be based around the fact that we can do more with wood, but there will be, um, limitations of design for an example our navigations bridge there's no way that you could build a big can, uh, bridge that can leave us out over on an angle and over you could build a big arch bridge with timber but you couldn't do it both ways it wouldn't support and so we have to do it with steel and and it's as simple as that we have to so if you really want wood with that you're going to have to have a look re revisit the design so um mm. so it's it's pretty it's pretty obvious stuff it's pretty logical but I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm happy to support Councillor Seymour, Councillor Foster, Councillor Wilson. And moving the um, paper, if you refer to the next page, 132, it's, I think we're trying to make a mountain out of a molehill. It's not going to be pure wood necessarily, Councillor Dowsing. I mean, this is a lot of timber in this building. Look at the ceiling, look at the power um, building, the um, timber work outside. And if you look at Rotorua District Council's wood first policy, it's got three broad objectives. I'm sure that's what the mayor is asking for, broad objectives. And it says requiring wood to be used in all council building projects. Well, wood will be used in all council building projects. It doesn't say it's the only thing that will be used. And we all knew that we committed to this building as a low, a low single story light wooden structure with some steel holding it up. So I don't think we should get ourselves too tied up. Um, and, and the three principles on page 132, which is the Rotorua um, Lakes Council's broad principles, make a heap of sense. Encouraging the use of wood, we grow it by the mile. We always say we should be using it rather than shipping every, actually every tree over the port, and we will be using it, and requiring wood to be used in our building and actively supporting and advocating for the Thank you. Councillor Foster. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, congratulations. Um, this, um, this is a fantastic um, initiative to, to bring to the table. Um, it's a pity it probably wasn't done a little bit, a bit sooner, but it just falls in line totally with the whole um, government new policy, planting more trees and um, having encouraging more wood production in this region. And as you see all around the world, every other wood producing region has um, adopted a similar type um, philosophy as well. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's a fantastic. And um, the more that we can implement it regionally, the better. It'll attract, help attract a lot more uh, wood friendly businesses to the region as well, while we're trying to grow this industry. So um, yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Uh, your Worship, I was just going to say exactly the same what Councillor Seymour said. Let's take uh, this. Councillor Finn. Yeah, just ahead, thank you, Your Worship. We could go as far as Kitsap wooden wheelie bins. <laughs> you never <laughs> there know. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, for the rabbits. <laughs> look at those um, bamboo type things now that you use for plates and. Um, cocktails and that now you no, know once upon a time that wasn't even available yeah but yeah. now you know they're strong 
aren't they, Councillor? Yeah. And, and you know, like Hawke's Bay, you know, GE3. The number of businesses now that are actually focusing on that, and more particularly, you know, like Bostock, um, in the organic hundreds of hectares and leading the way um, in, in that field. Anyway, thank you, councillors. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Contrary carries. Right, and the next topic is... On the agenda 191, moved by Councillor McLean, seconded by Councillor Seymour. Councillor Seymour has a comment. All yes, in favour? An error in the Aye. Con carried. No general business. I have no petitions. Nothing. We haven't voted on anything because we stopped you doing it. You nearly, voted, nearly put it. But no, we have put it. And then we allow you to ask the question. Is that right, councillors? Am I right for a change? Great, eh? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Oh, gee, I feel so good. Um, <laughs> a, uh, let's close the Futures Tata Fiti and begin our council meeting. We've had the karakia for the morning. Thank you. Declarations of interest can come now or a later stage, let us know. Ordinary minutes of the meeting, we're all present. We note that um, in the first one, Councillor Akuhata Brown, a couple of minutes. Hey, it's all right. Uh, page six to 13, I move. Seconded by Councillor Burdett. Council agenda, this one. Okay, got it? Okay. Moved by count myself and second by Councillor Boudet. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Contrary carried. Any matters from those minutes? Sure. You've read that. Any other? So we can go to the action sheet now. Any matters arising from that, from the update? Thank you, Nadine, for that. Okay. None of those other things, blah, blah, blah. Late item, we accept the late item. Moved by Councillor Stoltz, seconded by Councillor Foster. All in favour? Aye, contrary carried. Councillor Fadehinger, going backwards. Can you actually turn your microphone on? Sorry. Um, in the in the minutes, the vote for Tairawhiti Voyaging Trust, I was late on that day and I actually missed that vote, but it says that I voted for. Okay, we'll correct that. Thank you. All right, okay. So we have a reports, page 17 to 29. Community facilities approval. Um, if you weren't able, able to open the um, seven appendices, you could now. Right. Um, Yvette, are you going to talk to it? Or is there any questions? <coughs> has been well socialized. It has been facilitated with our community widely. And we've come to decision making. And obviously, there are other parties involved in um, this, and it's not just council, but we do need to take a lead role. Councillor Cranston. Uh, yeah, I'll move. Um, yeah, as you say, it has been well socialised with the community, and uh, it's not just a council document because it's something that was requested from the funders as well. So um, there will be nervousness that it could have associated dollars come with it in the future, but that's not for this discussion because that will all the dollars that will be connected with this will be part of the long-term 
planning process as well. So this is about strategizing a way forward in this space. So um, yeah, I'm quite happy to move it. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Fenn. Councillor Whadehinga. I just want to support what uh, Councillor Cranston, uh, Cranston has been saying uh, in regards to the community facilities uh, strategy. It's about a cohesive uh, plan moving forward that encapsulates the entire the entire Tairawhiti region. Thank you. Can I acknowledge the good work um, um, led by Councillor Cranston, but also from the community input. Um, also acknowledge the um, Eastland Community Trust for funding the strategy itself. Um, they wanted the strategy done, um, also to actually give them an indication of what the future commitments of funding collaborations are going to be for our district. So any further matters? All in favour? Aye. Contrary? Yes, one question. Uh, sorry, it was, just, it was just in regards to the, um, the quantity of time spent by staff on this. I'd really, enjoy, I'd really appreciate that being included in the budget in, in future because it shows we've, we've invested 50% of the budget at 68,000. But with that uh, time element factored in as well, our contribution is actually much greater to this and it would be, um, it'd be considerably easier to understand the budget involved if we saw that mm -hmm. figure. And the other thing too, just adding on to that, also the voluntary contribution should be noted as well. Because a lot of people give up a lot of time to attend meetings, consultation. Okay, so if we can do that as a general thing for all of our things, and you have a look at the, um, you know, later, later on there will be the swimming pool trust. And, and really the funders want us to know exactly what contribution is coming, not only from the council, but from the time that our community has put in. And same as the War Memorial Theatre, um, Cycleway Trust, those, all those groups that are supporting council. So if that can be a normal thing, it can happen. Good idea. Okay. Ownership's position, and I just want to know if that's within budget or is that an um, additional? So, Your Worship, as part of the um, steps going forward, we need to work out what we can actually implement within the budget. So, um, the activity summaries that you saw yesterday, had, and we will be discussing shortly, had a um, had been primarily based on business as usual, with some aspects of community the community facility strategy being incorporated, but we still need to go through another step, depending on the outcome of this passes shortly, around um, aligning more of the action. So it may be that um, when and if a vacancy does come up in Andrew's team, that, that we then look at that position going forward. Thank you. Mm. Can, I, can I just, um, uh, through you, Nadine, um, acknowledge Yvette? Um, I, I mean, from where I sit, this has been one of the most comprehensive um, documents and strategies presented. It has been done on time, and, and I can remember it was only last year that we actually approved this at ECT for funding, and to have it just after Christmas is um, absolutely fantastic. So 
just um, if you can convey that to um, Yvette uh, for us. Um, Nadine, I know that she sits here, but we only have one employer, and and um, I'm sure you'll do that in an appropriate way. Excuse me, so, Worship. Councillor Cranston. Worship. Excuse me. Yeah. Oh. Councillor Cranston, okay. and then Councillor Finn. Okay. Yeah, just um, to uh, just answer Councillor Thompson's concern there. Um, right through the process, it has been reiterated at every meeting that the financial position of council and the funding implications that council wouldn't be able to bear on this, that has been adequately um, uh, said to the public that have been involved in this meeting. I do take your point though going forward, we need to keep that message coming through. So. Thank you. Councillor Finn. Thank you, Your Worship. I just wanted to um, tag on to what you were saying. Thank you, Yvette, for all the work you and your staff have done. Um, I think finally we have a blueprint where we are working in collaboration and not in silos for the whole of our community. And I just think that is awesome. And it's awesome to see this type of thing going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, all in favour? Aye. Contrary. Carried. Thank you very much. Now we go to page 30, which we had a workshop yesterday, which was very helpful because it actually ironed out some of the nuts and bolts. We have a large document in front of us. It is a important document and um, the floor is open. Yes. Oh, you wish, um, just before, um, I just want to make mention that some of the feedback received um, during yesterday's workshop will, will be incorporated um, into the activity summary. So the approval, the recommendation is, um, is subject to including all the feedback that we receive. Council, yeah, oh, can move by Councillor Dowsing, seconded by myself. Any, yes, Councillor Seymour. Just um, a question for clarity for everyone, for all of our benefits. So uh, in response to the question, the comment the Chief Executive just made, is that just the change sheet of activity summaries which have been tabled this morning, A853516, or are there other changes? Uh, it's the change sheet that was tabled. Is, it, is the only change to the document we have. Thank you. Councillor Dunn. Um, yesterday we didn't do commercial operations, did we? And there's a summary there for that. So maybe we should go to that and discuss that before we move everything. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Who's presenting that? Ms. Pauline's coming up. Councillor Wilson. Yes, Your Worship. Uh, of course, uh, there were more things raised on that sheet. So are you telling us that um, if any further changes, we will have to Uh, no, through your worship, it's, um, that, that's from yesterday and whatever we take from also today, we will incorporate. Yeah, but I'm talking about from yesterday. Yesterday was more comprehensive than just those yeah, exactly. three things on there. So, response to questions so that, council, yesterday, huh? that councillors had asked prior to yesterday, we had some corrections. Mm. So there, what are we saying, there, Nadine? Can you give us assurance? that the workshop notes that were um, commented on yesterday are going to be incorporated in this draft that we have today. The I worship will... clarity, it's this document that was tabled yesterday, which was in response to queries people had asked previously. Plus other things. I know there's Plus a change sheet, sheet that should be in circulation at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a change sheet that we tabled this morning, which incorporates um, the, the the Q&A uh, handout from yesterday, what and are, how we're proposing to respond to those. The point of order. One at a time. And, and, and I'm not saying that uh, you need to pick a direct necessary to have to put it in them, but I, I, I don't see it on here, so I, that's why I asked the question, if it's not on here, do I have to put the plan to get it on the table again, which is, hang on, is the issue about changing sheets Hmm. That, um, well, it, the process will be now that this is the point within which you get a resolution from the council to then include that particular item in the 
draft consultation document. I support. Plan. Does everybody else support? Yeah. Any other people supporting? This is very important. It's been brought up before. We've had submissions here. People changing under the trees, uh, not appropriate. Um, the changing shed only holds two, two or three uh, persons. Um, so yeah. Councillor Burdett, next. No, no, no. no. Wrong language. What? You look right at me. Yep. Sorry. No, what's Councillor Burdett? Yeah. Yeah, Councillor Burdett. Thank you. There's one issue then, and I've raised it before on a number of occasions. Animal control. Bring that thing up here. And, and reviewing that in terms of we had an, an, an extra 180,000 from the transport agency. <clears throat> As we know, the coast, the whole of the coast is notorious for animals on the road, be they horses, cattle, dogs, pigs, they're there. Our, our current officers struggle with the hours that are allocated to do the job. And I have asked, uh, given that there's this extra funding come in from the agency, that a reallocation of how they do their job be done. I'm just suggesting here be noted for the long-term plan, because even now they're still struggling. Ideally, um, enforcement should go and check all the fences to make sure that the boundary fences yeah. are, have not got holes in them. You know, they do. Mm. Councillor Dunn. Yeah, back to your query on the um, sheds at the beach. Is this going to be a policy across the whole of our district, or are we just targeting Waikanae? because lots of the areas of the beach are used, pipes used as much as Midway is, Wainui is well used. So just wondering how broad the scope's gonna be. Councillor Wilson. Oh, you wish. Look, look, look okay, but I can understand that that could be a concern that you need to right across the whole district. But Waikanae is, uh, is uh, an area that is more populated by more people and we have had requests in the past for Waikanae, not from any other areas. Uh, in our consultation in the past. So I think it's a good start to, to see what, uh, investigate what sort of design, as Councillor Dowdy said yesterday, there are some better low cost designs that could be uh, promoted. Um, mm. Let's just try one first. Yeah, I see that the um, other other toilet facilities actually have bigger areas like Turihawa. Yes. They have a, um, a larger area for changing. Um, Makarori, no, because there's only a toilet Why there. No. So no, that might be no. incorporated in future designs when we upgrade toilets and that sort of thing. Councillor Dowsing. Thank you. Also, I support um, Councillor Dunn's uh, uh, concern for the whole region. I think if we get into the point of discussing where every single item goes in the region, we might as well start talking about where we need individual rubbish bins, and I don't think that's the level we need to be having this discussion. Um, I think it's a great idea to put to to put something in place, and if it works and if it's cost effective, then we can um, we can roll it out as we see fit. And like we say yesterday, there could be um, natural plantings to create that sort of ambience of changing <laughs> in the bushes. <laughs> oh dear! Let's lift the grade of debate, Councillor Seymour. Thank you, uh, thank you, Worship. Just to go back. To where we were at the very beginning, I still want to be clear that some of the corrections that sh sh that we've tabled yesterday was, and you know, one of them was respect to de um, depreciation. What we're trying to grant. Sorry, yes, um, for your worship, uh, I don't have a copy of the change sheet in front of me, um, but I have noted yesterday that there were a number of inclusions and or omissions in the activity summaries around the capital. Um, money for from the book trusts as, a, as an example. Um, there are a number of other ones that we've jotted down. So that change sheet, this one here, and the eyes, I can see it hasn't picked up the other um, points. Mm. Mm. Mr. Zaman. Can you use your microphone so people listening can hear? Yeah. 
No, I think it's good to come to the front. And <laughs> I know the idea is to, for you to speak there, and it wasn't about that. It's about face to face. Thank you very much. Through you, Your Worship. Um, yes, the, in answer to Councillor Seymour's question, um, in the change sheet it reflects that the animal control activity has been changed. So for the consultation document, there will be a new category in terms of critical requests for dog and animal control. That has been drafted and will go out in the consultation document. Great. So all those issues that we discussed yesterday, including your changing sheds, are in there. I'm sure our secretary has taken good notes in terms of those changes. You've even got some aspects that um, are missing from the change sheet. So it has been moved and seconded. Councillor Seymour. I have one further matter, Your Worship, which I flagged to the Chief Executive, which I noticed last night isn't in here. And it was a small matter of a walking and cycle track in Oawa, Tolaga Bay, which was raised three years ago. And I just noticed yesterday that it hadn't, last night, hadn't made it into here. And it's, it may or not proceed, but I'd like to see that it is included. And it was to continue to walk and cycle over the Oawa Bridge along past Hawiti and Hawiti Road to then join on to what is now a paper road, which then comes out onto Rangatuia Road. So it's not extensive. The work was prepared and it was taken back to uh, Titarangi, which is the station uh, over or adjacent to whose land. So there's a lot of consultation still to happen, but I just want to see that it gets into the 10-year plan, please. Councillor Stoltz. Um, can I make a suggestion? We had some corrections made yesterday and some today and some new ones today. If we can maybe get a summary of all of that. So by the time we come to studying the document again, we know exactly what we raised and if it was accepted or mm. not. Thank you. Um, if I can just add, um, you haven't got it there, the other ones that were relating to other changes, one of them was the unfunded depreciation. There is another paper when I'm starting to report you come to them, which is the draft estimates, and these ones that comes in relation to the, to the strategy. Um, and also, it talks about the main changes that we discussed yesterday, and it'll have it in this. Report to you very soon. All right. Councillor Dunn. Okay, are we going on to the commercial operations paper now? Because no. we didn't discuss that yesterday as one of these activity yeah. summaries. Page 181, I think. Nadine. Nadine. Um, oh, not Nadine. Uh, Your Worship. So the commercial operations paper has been ba largely based upon status quo with some narrative around potential transfers in the future and that's subject to um, further consultation. So um, that, that's why we didn't present yesterday, um, mainly it's because there has not been any, any substantive changes. There's further due diligence to do on a number of fronts. Okay, yes. Carry on. Can, can I just ask then what, what all the expenses on page 185, what, what do they relate to? Chief Executive? Yep, I'm just waiting for Pauline pulls our spreadsheet up. Sorry, can we get the question, please? The question Again, was on page 185, what are the expenses relating to? So those expenses um, relate to the activities that we have there, which is housing is in there throughout the um, length of the uh, long-term plan. There is airport, there's the forestry, um, the commercial activities, um, minor properties that haven't been sold over to GHL. So that's what the expenses on an ongoing basis have been estimated. And, and most of those are based on the status quo of what is now, unless there's any other spikes, forestry or, or whatever. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, I'm just considering where it says uh, down here at the bottom of the page, 
council is reviewing the funding and depreciation of War Memorial Theatre and proposed that it will have a total upgrade in the two years of planning. That's currently what it that was a mistake. An error, and the next paragraph is a correction. Yeah. It, it was found, um, Councillor um, Seymour raised it as an error, and so that's why we adjusted oh, it. Okay. So, this is the changes okay. what we'll call that. <laughs> I had mine got it. Careful, careful. Yeah. We only need the roof changed. repair. Okay. I mean, we've got other shots at this <laughs> later on once we do the consultation anyway. Yeah. Right? Modify or add or whatever. All in favour? Aye. Contrary, carried. Thank you. Um, I am advised that I should actually have uh, page 211 the draft financial strategy for consultation before the draft estimates. Okay, so we'll go to that, to page 211 to page 237. I'll give you a minute to get there because it's a long slide across the bar. Who's leading Pauline Yvette, right? So I'll just, um, just through your worship, um, the financial strategy you may recall in December last year and in previous workshops, we looked at the high level principles that you would apply. Um, your financial strategy has some legislative requirements of what's your limits on debt and um, rates. So we took away from yesterday um, the lowering of the debt cap to 100 million in years four to 10. Uh, and I'll hand it over to Yvette and Pauline to walk you through and, and we'll answer any specific questions that you might have. I'll, right. just, I'll just give a quick overview of um, the, some of the key points to, to focus on. Um, it's really captured in paragraph 7 to 10 of that report, but in summary it's essentially the, the way that we, the story is that um, we have some really core infrastructure with, with critical needs at the moment. Um, the revenue that we collect based on our current settings, debt and rate settings, is not enough to fund our capital projects. Um, for instance, our renewals budget where there is insufficient CAM reserves that we've collected over time from depreciation. So the strategy is suggesting that um, we increase the total income streams across both debt, rates and dividends from GHL. Um, with debt, you've already made that call yesterday, 80 million rising to 100 million, not 105, <laughs> um, from year four, um, and rates and increases capped at a 5% rate in general, um, with a doubling of the GHL dividends. Uh, so that's, that's in a nutshell what we're trying to achieve, that by the end of the LTP, we should have sufficient reserves, again, to continue um, to be able to be in a more resilient financial position. And the second thing is to note there's a graph on page um, of the strategy which shows um, the with red arrows. And that graph is quite crucial because it really gives you... Um, yeah. And that gives you, shows you that you actually have some options and some wiggle room. Those red arrows indicate space for where you can choose to actually um, pay the debt off earlier, replenish reserves, or um, there's skin, there's some wiggle room with emergency repairs as well. So if any of these emergency capital repairs which have pinged us in the past, you've got that scope and that wiggle room. So there is some resilience still and some, yeah, mm. that's all I wanted to say. Councillor Foster. Thank you. Um, can I make a suggestion? When, when we are um, going out to the public with um, a 5% uh, potential rate increase for the next six years, can we give an example? Like, can we say the rate, a 5% um, increase on rates of $2,000 is the equivalent of $1.92 a week? And that puts things into perspective a little bit. When people think 5% increase, um, any increase, um, dollar signs go out of control. But in reality, when you put it down to a $1.92, 5% increase on a, on a um, rate increase of $2,000 is $1.92 a week. It puts things into a little bit of a better perspective, I believe. 
So having that scenario there um, would be helpful. Thank you very much. I didn't say only. Well, I didn't say only. Well, I just said as an example. I said as an example on a rating. No, no, hang on. Councillor Thompson was speaking, and then you can reply. Yes. Councillor Thompson. Your Worship. If you're going to start saying that, then it's got to be meaningful to everyone. Again, it's, it's otherwise, it's just pointless saying it. If people can't work out what 5% is mm -hmm. on their rates, then I don't think they'd own a house and be paying rates. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and again, I just find that it, it, takes, it takes the reality away from people who pay a lot more rates and, it's, it, and, and making it sort of, um, it's actually sort of not acknowledging that situation. So I, I, I don't think we should be doing that at all. Um, in the um, comms strategy, I saw a note there that um, there was a breakdown. So it can be an and. Okay, Councillor Stoltz. I just wanted to support both things. When I was thinking about this, I agree with what document where we did say if you choose this option it will add seven dollars or it will add um twelve dollars and then i think your comment is a bit harsh where you say people that can't calculate five percent shouldn't own a house i wanted to that up he said that i said i think people that own three or five or ten million dollar properties should be able to if we give these small percentage increases should be able to do their own math to see how much that adds to their pockets. So I just wanted to turn that um, around a bit. He did say that, Pat. Councillor Dunn. Do I have to Can we just sort of take the personal stuff out and deal with the facts? Yeah. Eh? Um, yeah. I really enjoyed reading this uh, financial strategy. Um, there's a few spelling errors, but I don't think it's important. There is, I'll That's share them with you because the actual policy probably doesn't need to be logically correct. Um, on page 228, Underneath the key directive one, I was just wondering whether wastewater should be in that list because that is a pretty major investment for the region because um, it's not actually in there. And on page 236, when I get there, um, growing the rating base, it says ensuring long term sustainability, sorry. Ensuring long-term sustainable water for horticulture through the managed aquifer recharge project. I'd like to see that be a bit broader, that it's not just the MAR that we're looking at, that we're looking at other avenues for um, sustainable water use, because at the moment there's only about 36 users on the Makodi aquifer, and there are a lot of other options available for us. I was just hoping we could broaden that, and not make it so specific to the MAR. Thank you. Okay, all good. Has been moved and seconded. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Can, can I, sorry, I uh, apologise. Oh. There are some minor changes that will occur um, into the, uh, it's just that we will review it so that it's alignment with the infrastructure strategy. There'll be sort of changes that any assumptions made in infrastructure, they'll carry through to the financial strategy. So they're standalone mm -hmm. documents, so you don't have to read twice. Um, and um, if there's any requirements of audit, um, we may have to make some changes. For instance, they may ask us to separate the dividend streams from GHL, so it's explicitly stated within the years as it is forecasted in the plan. So there may be some minor changes. It doesn't change fundamentally to the document. And, and you know the um, caps of borrowing. Those decisions always have to come back to be justified in the first instance before the council game borrows the money. Hey. But I do have a philosophy, like um, all financial advisors say, pay your mortgage off first. Not store some money in your savings account, but save through paying your mortgage off first. So I hope that this will be the philosophy of council. Right, moved by myself and was seconded by Councillor Foster. Sorry, secondary never heard. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary, carried. And we go to page um, 2187. 187. <laughs> 187. I said go to page 187. <laughs> yeah, you understand? <laughs> 187. Okay, and that paper is draft estimates. And again, yesterday through the workshop, we had a good, yep, moved by Councillor Seymour, seconded by Councillor McLean. Those thoughts? have been incorporated, like the library money from the trust, the extra changing sheet, those sort of things will be um, developed to reflect the resolutions of council? Uh, yes, through your worship, as um, Councillor Stoltz um, requested, we will compile all of that and into one um, information sheet to show you which ones have been included to make sure we've captured everything. Fantastic. Okay, it has been. Can I just, uh, yes, one sure. One point for um, clarification, I'd like to ask Mr. White to make to make clear. If you look on two hundred one on one of the spreadsheets, uh, through your worship. Uh, that's the residual sum that we estimated would be left in the project uh, after the expenditure this year. You have them on, someone comes and turns them off, and then, and then forget it's not off. So we have a figure of three million, and this is 2068, and even I couldn't work out why it suddenly went from three million to 2068, because the project has a budget of around three million. Well, some of that three million will be spent before year end that we're in now. So this is the first year of the LTP's sum of money. So, I just, so that everybody's clear when, they, when we come back reporting on the project what the total project might be. That is next year, the first year of the annual plan money, I think. Yeah, yeah different years. All good? All in favour? Oh, sorry, Councillor Dowsing. So, uh, um, in relation to both of these papers, this and the, and the previous, I think the, um, the really important thing to, to maintain is that uh, delivery of this budget is key to our success. We've... Um, yeah, having a having a, an ongoing deficit for the previous few years, plus not uh, not reaching our um, capital works expectations, um, we are simply compounding the problem of, of mm. trying to renew aging assets over a shorter and shorter period of time. So every year that we fail to meet our aspirations within our budget, um, make the following years harder. So. Both of these are both of these have been good financial documents. They've they've made good sense, and really the only the only consideration that I see that needs to be taken is is ensuring the governance monitor uh, every activity well enough and and make sure that delivery is made on those budgets. Hmm. So can we have assurance of that, um, Mr. Chief Executive? Yes. <laughs> Yes, you can. Yes, you can have assurance of that. Actually, Great. That goes through from the objectives you set for me mm. down to my staff. Yeah. Great. Great for the public record. Um, Councillor Wilson. Yeah, and, and just to follow on from that, look, um, we as government can only control what goes on by the level and quality of information we give and timely information. So uh, I think for this year, we councillors have to take responsibility too. If we don't believe that we're getting the right information, Well, the buck stops with us, it does. right? Because the community expects if you're going to do say something, do it. Right, Councillor Dunn. Yeah, I just um, I went through all of these reports and put them all together and came up with what I call Amber's virtual draft LTP. And um, I'm really proud of what's in all these documents and what mm. we are taking to the community. Mm. I think that the um, 
the CE and all of her team have captured the, the vital few things that we really want mm -hmm. to invest in. Um, it also clearly states that we're working within tight financial constraints, which means that we do have to lift our debt cap. But it does also really um, explains really well that these are value adding investments and that mm -hmm. this is what our community needs if we actually do want to be successful. Um, so I just wanted to congratulate the CE and all of her team because it's looking like a really awesome draft document. Um, and it'll be really nice to see what the public has to say about it, even when it's got rate increases in it. But we're mm. talking about investing for success, so. Mm. Do you think it's aspirational? Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. Yes. <laughs> okay, um, we, yes, a lot of work from all of us. Team, team. Right, all in favor? Contrary carried. Next paper, 299 to 328 is the Treasury Management Update Draft. Did I miss one? <laughs> Revenue Finance, 238. Policy. Okay, well, it's, well, they're similar, are they? Um, where are we? Yeah, 238 to 98. Yeah, 238 to 99 is wrong. 238. Right. Any leaders? Well, I'll just tend to move the recommendations on that number two. Um, it seems that the revenue policy is the differential rate wage rate policy will be 10.5. Okay. Yeah. Moved by Councillor Wilson, seconded by Councillor Boudet. Yeah. yeah. Five to 7.5. Did you read? Read? So basically, at this stage, we're not dealing with any rates for emission. That's how I understand it. And um, are there actually proposed changes in that remission, in the remissions policy? It, it's status quo at the moment, um, apart from the piston um, plants, which is we, when we did the revenue and financing policy, and uh, when we changed that, we found that there was only one particular um, rate rating unit was over a thousand dollars, so that could be applied as a generic um, and, and a burden or whatever. Um, but and, and there would only be bolstering up a general that would, but That's the right. rest of them would be standing as they are until we have a review of the revenue and financing policy um, to take it in conjunction. Thank you for that. I just thought there might have been something big going on that mm. wasn't ready. Mm. Be aware that Mr. Zaman did indicate that there's going to be more recoveries, isn't there, Mr. Zaman? Through the policy. This is what you be careful. Yes, Mr. Zaman? You can just hold it in your hand. This one works. Um, yes, Your Worship, that we are con and we're going to be consulting on the um, cost recovery policy for council, which will be going out, which as I pointed out yesterday, looks at a recovery of about 230K a year um, from a user pay mm -hmm. systems in terms of consents and compliance. Well, we're consulting, okay? So we've got another chance. Okay, any other matters regarding this? Revenue financing policy, all in favor? Aye, Aye. country carried. Now we go over the page to 299. And it's called the Treasury Management Update for the Draft 2018 to 2028 Long Term Plan to page 328. Now, we've had a little go at this. 
Um, just want, would uh, like to bring your attention. Um, when we had the change sheet um, that was here, uh, on the last page of it, it says the liabil liability management policy. So when we change the cap of the debt to from 105 million to 100, um, it changed some of those benchmarks to, to be lower to make sure that they align with those. And so that's a little bit of a, an adjustment to those um, that's in there. Okay. All right, Minister of Finance. Yeah. Mr. Walton. Okay. The recommendations you're happy with? Yeah. All right. That'd be great. Moved by Councillor Wilson, seconded by Councillor Fadihinga. Any other questions, comments, additions? Yes. Uh, I have no questions. I do have a comment. It's um, great to see in our, uh, in our investment policy that we have a, a, a really strong, robust um, statement that we're making in regards to uh, our ethical behaviour and what we'll be looking at in regards to moving forward. Something that I bandied on about last year, and it's fantastic to see that it's included in it uh, this year. So, kia ora. Kerry, thank you very much. Um, roof has been replaced, and we go to page 362. How's that? Yeah, page 262, a one-pager report there regarding amendments to the meetings, and there was, we fixed up that eight-week, ten-week gap, have we? No. No. What was, yeah, 362. One pager or two pages as a pull out. Now we we did have that gap, remember? Yeah, 12, 10 weeks with what was the answer to that, um, Nadine? Just talk. It doesn't matter. You don't need votes. My husband can't hear. Oh. Um, <laughs> so just, just for, for the uh, meeting schedule, um, there is a future tight RFT meeting in between that 10 week period. So we're supposed to have council every six weeks. Um, and should we need to, we can change that to being part future tight RFT part council. That is on the 27th of September. No, the concern was about 10 weeks between the August and October meeting, as I understand it. Okay. All in, um, has been moved and seconded. Thank you. All in favour? Aye. Contrary carried. Page C364, request for um, funding for the Mutu Trails. And um, I have a view again. This is a tourism product which should be part of the tourism platter of funding through one organisation. Yes, Pakehi Motu is special. So are a whole lot of other tourism um, products that are promoted throughout the district. It needs that coordination. It cannot be done in isolation. And I think we should actually uh, forward this to um, the tourism um, of AT for them to consider to put it in their annual plan money. Councillor Olson. Thank you. Councillor Dowsing. I uh, completely agree with you as well, His Worship. Um, I believe, in fact, that part of this was funded out of Tourism Eastland's budget in the, in the past. Is that no. correct? No. Oh, okay. It's well, it, it, fits, it, it fits within that profile, and we, we already support them through funding um, by way of ECT and, and AT, so it should come from that budget. Councillor Stoltz. Well, I can obviously see that I'm not going to get support for my 
from for what I want to say, but what I would like to say, as I see there might not be support for what I wanted to say is that we, can we actively make it part of our recommendation that we pass it on to activate Tairafiti and encourage them to fund this because the way I looked at this is that a Potiki District Council and DOC and GDC are in a co-share governance agreement. Um, I have 100% understanding for where we're coming from. We have had several of re these requests in the last few years. And last year or two years ago, we established those funds. From what I see in this application though, is that the chairman of that trust did fill in one of our $20,000 a year funding applications. I'm not sure if that sits in that $200,000 funding envelope, which we made for this, which um, Nadine alluded to that might, the money might not exist. But what I would like to say is because we are a Potiki District Council and DOC each contribute each year with us, and we have up to now for the last six years, um, if councillors will not support this, can I ask that we really make it part of our recommendation that we urge or ask Activate Tairafiti um, to please make sure this good work is carried on because as you can see, the trust does great work. The trails are free. So what they are doing is generating income for those businesses in Motu and Matawai through accommodation and eateries. And um, um, so it's not a direct benefit, it's more indirect benefit for our region. So I will finish now by saying, can we please press upon Activate Tairafati in our recommendation to consider this to, so that this trust can carry on doing the great work that they do. Hmm. And, and that's what we're suggesting. Yep. Thank you for that passionate speech. Thank you. Oh, your former neighbour. Um, Councillor Dunn. Uh, are, are we saying that we're going to be giving, Gisborne District Council is going to be giving no money to support the trust? Yep. What are you saying? Um, given that all the other councils around the place that have this trail are supporting it, I think there should be some contribution from the council. I don't know what quantum, but... Mm. Councillor Foster? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm... Like, well, Portiki District Council support this. Whakatane, who are not directly um, related to it, they support it as well with financially, uh, 20,000, I believe. Um, so um, I, I'm um, sympathetic with um, Councillor Stoltz, and um, I think that we should be seen to be supportive. The Heartland Trail is directly related to that, and that would be a um, direct benefit to us here as well. Um, I would like to see if we are going to pass the buck that we do ensure that there is um, a strong recommendation to our tourism branch that they do take up this opportunity um, and, um, and, and help out. And um, we are... Um, our logo is um, there somewhere as well because our logo is actually the Gisborne District Council logo is important to be tagged onto this um, trail, like El Portiki and Fokatane, because this is a um, it is a, a venture between the, the three regions, attracting people here. The Heartland Trail is really important. Mm. Councillor Seymour, thank you, Worship. Uh, we are always financially constrained, and I know it's a right challenge, but if you reflect on the decision that was made last month, the last meeting before Christmas, that was even more generous than this. So this is asking that an application be considered for funding through the 18 to 28 LTP. So I am going to move, and I don't think you've got a recommendation yet, have you? No. Right, so I move, one, we note the content of the report, and two, we recommend that an application that the application for the Motu Trail Charitable Trust of $10,000 per year be considered by council through the 2018, 20, 2018 to 28 LTP process. Mm. Councillor Whadihinga. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I will not be supporting that resolution. Um, just because other councils do things a certain way doesn't mean that we necessarily have to follow suit. I absolutely agree that um, 
this should be going to the tourism arm of Activate Tairawhiti. And actually, Activate Tairawhiti is council, so we are actually lending its support. It's about consistency of process and being clear with our community about the, the things that they're doing and where they should be going in regards to uh, their tourist activities. We're not a, a tourism arm. Activate Tairawhiti is. That's the message that we should be sending out to our community. It's not about the dollar value and how much it's going out and how easy it will be for us to make that decision here or becoming like the other councils. Uh, it's about us being clear with our community what those processes and what those organizations they need to be linking into that we actually do directly fund. So they will still be getting that support from us, but via the proper means. Thank you, Councillor. You both had speeches, so no more. Um, Councillor Burdett. Yeah, Councillor Burdett, first. Activate comes before Council, we roll over. Why is it? No, we haven't no, rolled over in yet. In this case, I totally concur with Brian and yourself. That's what Activate Tairawhiti is for. And this is where these kind of applications should go. Question, yes. Oh, yes. Um, in regard to that recommendation, could we add a um, supplementary to say that we would uh, ask Activate Tairawhiti to match council's contribution? Yes. How do you feel about that? No, you can't do that. <laughs> That's a, that's a second recommendation. Should it fail? No, she didn't get seconded. She's just asking Pat if she would consider that. No, you, yeah, it, it's, the, it's ultra virus. It's ultra virus. Where do you get the money from? You can't have a different council and a different AT. Excuse me, Your Worship. There's only one resolution. I won't accept the second one. Councillor Stoltz. No, no, I'm no. fine. Thank you. Councillor Fadihinga. Sorry, just for clarity, I did want to know if there is a resolution on the table and has that been moved and seconded? Okay. Yeah, moved by Councillor Seymour, seconded by Councillor Stoltz. Councillor Thompson. As a point of clarification, it was mentioned that um, we have this, this grant fund available on an annual basis, but, no, we don't. but I think that's in, credit, that's in debt for the next four or five years. <laughs> The discretionary fund that was um, previously there was was debt funded. So yeah, essentially there was. There is no free money. Well, there was last meeting. There is no free money. Can I request by Councillor division? Dowsing. Can I request by division for the vote? Sure, division. Councillor Cranston hasn't spoken. Yeah, I'd just like to say that um, I'm, I've turned into an active user of cycleways and walkways right around the country just been on one or two. Um, but I would hope that Active, um, Activate Tarafti would see that that is a growing resource throughout New Zealand and it's very important to economies. So um, the expertise that's on that board should see the importance of cycleways and walkways and recognise that this is something that should be supported. So I'm just hopeful that if it does go back there and it seems like it is going to go back there where it should go, that they do see the value in it. Um, this will be not, I, I dare say that in the next many years, this will not be the last cooperative cycleway, walkway between regions and cities and councils. Yeah, we hope that it will grow. Councillor Malcolm, you haven't spoken. Yes, I agree with um, most of the speakers. I think, you know, not, let's not get the community and ourselves confused. We do have a tourism arm, and that's where I think this funding should come from. Thank you. Question. Yes. Yeah, and, 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 and so that we can give them guidelines of what we think and they can update us. Yeah. They, they came to our December meeting. Sure. Councillor Finn. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'd just like it noted that I'm going to reserve judgment to comment on any of this and I'd like to abstain from any um, voting that goes on here, given... 
I work for Activate. Thank you. Thank you. That makes my job easier. All in favour? Can we just um, restate the motion for Heather and Coral? Councillor Seymour. Clear. No. 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 Motu Trails Charitable Trust of 10,000 per year be considered by council for funding through the 2018-28 LTP process. It's actually only putting it in the process if you read the words. Bad enough. And it clarifies the quantum. Thank you. All right, clear? All in favour, hands up. Because it's a division. One, two, three, four. Ooh, more supporters. Got them? Coral, Heather? Okay, again, hands up. Got it? You got it? Didn't want you to state the didn't want you to state the answer, just ask you if you got it. Got it? Right? Yep. Thank you very much. Lost. Councillor Dowsing. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'd like to move that uh, Council notes the contents of the report and uh, amends number two to read, recommends that the application for the Motu Trails Charitable Trust be forwarded to activate Tarapiti with Council support that they fund the trail. Okay, moved by Councillor Dowsing, seconded by Councillor Cranston. Any debate? Yes? Councillor Akuhata Brown. Just once. I just would like that if we are going to then um, make this the noted discussion for all things around funding, that people who are coming to GDC um, are perhaps then given the noted activate Tairafiti is the road you go to. It is the um, is the kind of mechanism that um, because I appreciate. Um, Motu trails have come to us because other councils are supportive and it sends us you know strong united space of um the role that other councils are playing in this space but yeah i i respect josh's notion that we, we want to do things our way too but it's important that um if we are going to because we do get others and, and council seymour has noted last year we had a crew um come to us and we did fund uh, another venture Quite a lot, and like me, um, 2018 year moving along the plans. I think we need to send a strong message that activate Tairafiti as the mechanism for tourism ventures um, and on ongoing because we will always have people come to us. So I think that meeting is councillor. All is that we need people to um, be given a clear message in our district, in our region, as to how they do this. So, from today's meeting, I, I sense that. I'm just saying, is that the case? Because if that is, let it be known to all the people, and um, let us agree, agree to meet with Activate to, to, to negate their space in this too. Kia ora. Let it be known that all tourism matters should be AT. Councillor Stoltz. What we should make clear here today is that all to, to staff through Nadine is that tourism related requests should by default from now on be sent on to activate Tairafati and councillors may be just having a noting paper stating that this came to us and it's been sent forward. So I do think it's a delegated authority thing where we say to staff now if stuff like this come. Yeah. Send it on to activate Tairafati. Mm. Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Your Worship. We can actually um, view this decision as a positive one because mm. at the end of the day, it's ten thousand dollars for the Motu Charitable Trust. Well, if tourism, uh, sorry, activate Tairafati, uh, believe that um, cycling trails, walking trails are something really important, 
they may fund the whole activity to a much higher level than even the Modu Charitable Trust uh, envisaging. Mm. And I would think that would be the case because it's well proven in other areas that there's a building momentum of um, cycling and walking as being a fantastic activity. Other regions have got into it, and I would think that that's a huge potential for our region. So council handling uh, a little bit of money to deal with it, I think it's much better in uh, where the experts are. And, you know, like with our plan with Air New Zealand, right, they wanted a collaborative plan that everybody goes on. And I know my deputy mayor has been advocating for that one plan, but now she wants to separate it. But that's OK. Um, but that's important that we act as a region in yes. tourism because people just don't go to one thing. They go to a mirror of um, products and activities in our district. So let's um, put that. All Aye. in favour? Aye. 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 Contrary. Carry. Thank you very much for that. Right. And Nadine, you know what to do now, don't you? All those tourism things go to, and business things. Not necessarily those things, but definitely <laughs> tourism. <laughs> tourism things. <laughs> tourism products. I think it's important, though, Your Worship, to note that GDC is is still seen in the leadership space of that. It's about how we activate it. <laughs> Otherwise, the, our region will think we're just- yeah. Let's activate tourism. Right. <laughs> Can I just raise a matter around what's recorded in our minutes from last year? Because just because they're there, that I tried, didn't want to be too specific about. Page 10, it is actually didn't tell you what we funded that Voyaging Trust to. It's not recorded in the minutes what the quantum of the dollars are. And I just think it might have been useful if it were. I have an idea in my head what it was. And I just think it Four. ought to have been in recorded in the minutes. And when we, I know I didn't bring that up the before. Showgrounds. Page 10, item 11.4. Yes. And when you look at what, and I'm not criticising the decision, we've made one, but when you go back to say, oh, hang on, well, what did we give that? And it's not recorded in the minutes what the sum of money was, and I think right. it should be. in the minutes? Yeah. So, okay. Yes, absolutely. It's quite yeah. right, Councillor Stoltz. Yeah, yeah. Four. That's fantastic. Yes. <laughs> All good. So um, could we have that amended so we do know, so there's a proper yeah. record, because it's not just for us, it's for others who choose for to read our minutes. Right, let's go to the Did I get a yes for late that? item, yes, yes, yes. yes. Right, let's go to the late item, which is not on your page, but in the handout. Um, the long-term plan rates modeling outcome late item. No, they've dropped it. Because You've got that in front of you? It's been withdrawn. That was the one that was circulated on Tuesday and uh, you received a hard copy Do yesterday. Do you still have it? If you haven't got it, put your hand up. Heather will get you one. It's on your docks. Heather said it's on docks. Late item. It's headed actually late item, folks. It does, it's not headed uh, long-term plan, rates, modeling, outcome. Late item. Kapai? No, okay. not quite. See. Not quite. Councillor Seymour still searching, searching. Searching for her LTP rates modeling outcome paper. Delaying things. We are. Have we all got it? <laughs> Good that some people got here. Okay, anything? We've got 1,096 viewers. So it is worthwhile. Our community is getting more engaged and enjoying the entertainment of the day. Yeah. yeah. At least they can't see me or they see you, Brian, but they can see these other people on this side and they go to sleeps. Oh, no. They adjusted the cameras. I thought I could have a snooze. It'll be interesting, some of the reports on the paper. Yeah, no, no, he's not picking mandarins. Councillor Thompson's not picking mandarins today. 
but wait till he's not here. Yes. He's picking mandarins. <laughs> English college miniature. Okay, Kaza Seymour, have you got it? Kapai. Okay. Uh, Pauline. Order, order. Thank you. It does. Push the button. Um, so we went through the um, in the workshop yesterday with most of the um, high overview with it, and I'll just go over that. And so if there's particular questions related to things in the specifics, Fiona will be able to um, adjust it. We'll talk to that as well. So um, as as mentioned, um, and that the overriding amount of rates that council need to collect um, is 4.89. Now that doesn't um, occur evenly across the district and it depends on what level of service that you receive or um, what changes you may have, such as the increase to the values of your property. They all have an impact on what the final incidence of um, rates will occur. Um, there were changes into the revenue and financing policy as we said um, yesterday with regards to the piston plants, it changes some of that into the UAGC. Um, but also overridingly, uh, the expenses that where they fell um, related mostly to the city. So with that, um, we saw uh, in particular that we needed to collect 2.6 million of more rates we did this year than last year, which equates to the 4.89, but of that, 77% um, of that fell into the city, which is why the city receives, on average, a 6.9% increase. Um, so that was the main changes. We went over those, and there was the impacts of the, uh, the heat maps, where you can actually see those things, and the outliers um, that is in, also in the report. Um, I think that's the main things, but I'm happy to answer any other questions that you may have. Any questions? Yes, Councillor Seymour. Thank you. Um, just with respect to the document, and it's on page six of this document, if this is going to be reproduced, is that going to remove the duplication of the rural transfer station, which is, appears twice in that bottom box, and also to the comment around um, under on page eight on rural towns, so that um, the explanation of the rate increase for rural towns where the a comment is made supply of services for water, will that be made clear that relates to particularly to Whatatutu and Tikaraka rather than as this reads at the minute, it could be understood to relate to all rural towns? Yes, Councillor Seymour, I'm sorry, I should have made that as a change sheet. It no, was definitely picked up. I just um, want to make sure it's been ca yes. captured. Both items. Yep. Thanks for the clarification. Thank you. Pauline. Um, any other matters, councillors? I shall move. Seconded by Councillor Burdett. Thank you for your good work. Under um, strange circumstances of no CFO, you've done a fantastic job in presenting the LTP figures. Can I ask the Chief Executive to convey that message to uh, the team? I am moving one and three. Yeah. Not the other one, because the other one's a different one, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, gosh. Ah uh, man, I've got them here. Read it out to me, Brian. <laughs> That's the one because that's consistent with the resolution we moved earlier on. Right? Cheers to that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Contrary, carried. Thank you. Right. You can have that. Yes. Right. We have no questions today, but. Um, me but that's not to the chair 
Anyway, we'll, we'll allow it. We'll allow it. Yes. Thank you. What's your question? Um, yep, sorry, uh, Councillor Wilson. Well, I did have a response back from the team, and Andrew White may want to jump in. But essentially, our consent for the existing beach sweep does not include the removal of seaweed. Um, so we're we're working with our consents team to see what is needed to in order to approve and amend the um, consent in order for the sweeping activities to resume. Mm. And then one one of the key reasons was that the um, removal of seaweeds actually um, prevented a stinging jellyfish not having a feed. <laughs> and that they would cause them distress if they weren't feeding on seaweed. Yeah, distress. And they sting more if they are stressed and they are hungry. Did you know that? Well, that's what I was told on the street. <laughs> the consent. Yeah. Um, I will defer to Andrew White on this because there are also some cost implications as well um, to the it's the level of service that we provide down there. So we start. Um, removing seaweed um, in addition has also got cost implications, but you might want to comment, Andrew. Uh, through your worship, that's correct. So there is the consenting side. There's also uh, the side that, uh, that we focus our resource into uh, scheduled works around our um, contracts. Because of the on and off nature of um, uh, matters like the seaweed uh, issue, that comes under what we call unscheduled. Uh, work and we have quite a large budget for that sort of thing. So that's work that we prioritise against other work. So um, that's the other challenge that we have. If we're, if we're looking at high cost, unscheduled pieces of work, uh, that basically means we don't do something else. So there's uh, some fairly serious thinking to do around that. So what happens with the current um, seaweed, Mr. White? No, no. The current when you there's a big scoop that comes along and picks up everything and does someone on the back of the truck actually chucks the seaweed back onto the beach mr white uh we do do a beach cleanup and it's not typically around seaweed that's an environmental uh, storm issue when it comes in uh, when we do our beach cleanup around um the start of october it's usually wood debris uh, that we're picking up there not seaweed mm, fantastic answer Count councillor's done yeah, could I um, recommend that maybe we talk to the seaweed collectors like Agri Sea Limited? They actually actively collect seaweed as part of their business. There's other yeah. ones out there too. Perhaps we could ask them yeah, to come in and consent. maybe they would like it as a resource. Yeah. Jill Bradley, you Agri need Sea. Consent. Someone no, was rejected, the wasn't last it? Item, the last time someone got consent Seymour. for commercial take, there were matters in opposition and the applicant withdrew their application application mm. so people pick up a particular kind of agar type seaweed along the coast beaches in small quantities when someone and i don't think that was the seaweed councillor arcada brown was pictured holding up in the paper so i think there's more issues to it than meets mm. the eye councillor foster brown stoltz yeah thank you um uh, tidy beach would have to be the um the biggest intake of seaweed on our local beaches out of anywhere um, locally here, you know, between Makarori and, um, and Young Nick's Head, we, there's so much seaweed there it knows, after every storm. And um, locals go there and pick it up for their gardens, uh, and um, it's mm. not a problem. It comes in, and goes, and it, we never ha there's never a huge build-up. There's never a, an issue, really. But if there is an issue with dock, with people taking seaweed off the beach, well, then it probably needs to be addressed. Mm. Um, I, I, what's the difference between council extracting seaweed 
off a beach for a, an event or the public going down to a, a beach and taking seaweed for their garden. Mm -hmm. um, we need to have some clarity here. Mm. Councillor Brown. Exactly, and I was just looking at that fine young man there, uh, Mr. Ridge Prophet, and asking to get some clarity. I, uh, to give context, I had a phone call from a um, surf life saving uh, personnel who was frustrated in this process of a resource consent to removal of seaweed or the beach sweep. I have since spoken with. Um, uh, Mr. White, uh, to get some story around the unscheduled space. But with the consent process, can you give me some clarity or us some clarity uh, in that? Because they were just frustrated at the runaround of going to see Doc. Then, you know, council was saying it's actually a Doc issue, et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanted, with your experience in this area, could you give us some clarity? Supplementary. Um, the, the 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 talk was that if um, we put the seaweed shore on the shoreline, um, obviously the ocean will take it away. <laughs> was one of the frustrations because obviously the, it brought it back as well. So I think there's some information needed in this space to people to understand this the issue with seaweed. So thank you. Thank you very much. That's uh, Councillor Stoltz, Councillor Dowsing. Beforehand Your and friends are can not be, listening. so there's there's some planning around it. So um, no, so whenever there's a big event, because that's what it was, part of the planning should be to clean it up and but do it plan well in advance. Thank Come you. To dowsing. Thank you, His Worship. Um, I think we're all missing the point here, and it's a coastal marine environment. This is a natural process. There, there is no reason to clean a beach. A beach is self-sustaining. We are, we're talking about actually going and, and, and manufacturing a play area for ourselves out of what is already a, an environment for coastal, inhabit, coastal habitat. We are, we're, it's, it's ridiculous. It's like going and saying we're going to pick up every twig that falls out of a tree or every leaf in autumn. We don't need to do it. The, the purpose is the, the purpose behind this is just so it's more aesthetically pleasing. Um, I understand why we pick up wood waste because we, we generate upstream a greater quantity of wood waste. So we need to deal with that. And it's an ambulance at the bottom of the hill situation, but, we're, but we have to clean that. No, where, this, where this stands is completely different. Councillor, look, are we going to make, there's no progress. All right, Councillor Wilson. Councillor Wilson. We're naturalists. Yeah. All right. I mean, I think it was like 
probably from the surf lifesaving people, they saw it was unfair competition just in case some some boats couldn't actually get to shore. Some people tripped over. She sells seaweed on the seashore. She sells seaweed on the seashore. Um, no, there's no resolution. Noted, noted. Can you thank our virtual <laughs> watchers? Oh, yes. Um, to our virtual watchers. They're actually live. They're not virtual. Yeah. I um, hope you enjoyed it. You, you'll be sending comments through our, um, our, our sessions and hope that um, you are seeing your hardworking councillors and your hardworking staff are working together as a team. And obviously, you know, we've got a few um, council celebrities now that actually want to get on TV often and they want to speak more than the standing orders have allowed. Um, but however, we are a very, um, hopefully we provided good entertainment and uh, informative information to our community today. So we are going to go into public excluded now and obviously um, things are going Not to be turned off. Not before some advertisements. Um, Get your mandarins from Graham Thompson. Yep. Turn the TV off. I move that we move into public excluded, seconded by Councillor Stoltz.